Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Hopefully everything is operating properly. Just making sure that I can pop out the chats and everything. I want to talk about something interesting before getting into it. Um, I've, I've talked about this subject before, but it's been a long time. And in the spirit of playing the Pokemon, I want to talk about the Pokemon. See what they're all about. Pokemon and or women. Watch the whole videos. Well, not the whole videos, but you know, the splices. Um, let's see. We were watching Phil, Dr. Phil, and um, what's his name? The hell's his name? Jordan Peterson. That's it. You guys didn't help me at all there, did you? All right. Let's talk about these nutter butters of epic proportions um let's see here One second sorry i'm eating um let's see pokemon what's this we moved into a home we leased a home for a while and um, not this one here. And we went in and we are a family who's understood. You don't fight or argue or you're not, you're not going to tear each other apart. We moved in and every one of us were tearing each other up. And we said, something is in this house. It wasn't before then it was, and it was empty. The house was empty, but we went, nope, we're going to go ahead and pray and annoy stuff. But it still kept going on. I said, then there's something in one of the rooms. So. We assigned everybody a room. They went everywhere in the closets and in one of the kids' closets in the uh, floorboard, you know, forget the molding on the floor around the, around the walls was a Pokemon card. These people are afraid of their own fucking shadows. All right. <clears throat> this says Pokemon was clipped but this isn't accurate. Pokemon, pocket monster. This All right, uh, let me just, I'm actually going to clip it because I, I know where this came from. I have the entire thing, the whole, it's a, wait, is it 35 minutes? Is this really 35 minutes? Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. Yeah, okay, see, there are multiple parts here. 35 minutes. In no. This is two and a half hours. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Now, a lot of things come over from the oh. Orient. A lot of things come over from the Orient. And some things have a big impact on us and some things don't. I can't think of anything that come over from the Orient that actually had a big impact or a phenomenon type craze other than Godzilla. But there is something new that's come over to the United States and has actually captured the minds and the imagination of every single child. And you know what? It's not new at all. Japanese kids have been watching this thing since 1995. It started out as a cartoon, went to a comic book. They made it into a video game. This is it. No need to clip. I've got it. Okay. Let's hit this one. <clears throat> Let me just get a nice shot of the stuff he's got up front there. Okay. <clears throat> Let me start recording. Um, hang on, just see. Now I'm going to play the game until this is done. Uh, let's see, 20 and 30. 20, 30. Okay, we're good. Let's start recording then.
All right. For those of you who don't know, this is the Pokey Man, is what I call him, Stephen Dollins. He talked about Pokemon a while back and claimed to be like a high priest in the Church of Satan and all kinds of other stuff. I talked about the whole video on my unfiltered channel. I'm sorry. I talked about the whole video on my unfiltered channel. If you want to watch it, oh, and unfiltered. But I want to zero in on the Pokemon stuff. And there's another guy named Phil Arms who's talked about this exact subject. Because it's important for the church to deal with issues as they come to the forefront in society. I said, son, what is that one morning? He said, that's, uh, that's Pokemon. Said, son, I found out that Pokemon means pocket monster. So anyway, there's that. And then there's his take on dancing. And it's sociological as well as physiological effect. And I discovered some alarming truths that have changed thousands and thousands of lives. That series contains it. You ought to get it if you don't have it. I believe it ought to be in every home and every church in America. I've tried to get the series he's talking about. He sends, you know, the, the whole... The phone number doesn't exist anymore. You know what? While I'm thinking about it, I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to write a letter to this guy since, I, since it's on my mind. <clears throat> Dear Pastor... All right, hang on. Let's see here. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Dear Pastor Arms, I really appreciate your takedown of Pokemon a few years ago, and I like your position on dancing. I would really appreciate it if you could send a copy of those VHS or DVDs to VHS tapes or DVDs to me at yeah, it's time to break this one off here. Uh, let's see. It would mean the world to me as I'm also a pastor and the Pokemon craze has taken over my church. Thanks so much for the consideration, Owen Morgan. Okay, so... Yeah, all right, cool. I think that's good. Now let's just blow this puppy up a little, make it a little bigger. And give it some double spacing. And change it to Times New Roman. put a, an enter and now I'm just going to plug it into like my <clears throat> my AI tool that I use to make sure my grammar sounds correct uh, and it, it, it does not the word really should never be used um, and the word very those are modifiers that are wholly unnecessary. All right, I'll erase it. Um, there should be a comma between ago and and.
it would mean the world to me if you could send a copy of those VHS tapes or DVDs to me so I can show my church the dangers of these pernicious practices. Okay, my AI tool is saying I did a good job. So let me just <clears throat> Let's paste this in. Please send a a uh, copy of each to blank. And then, okay, now here's what, here's the next step. While I go through this, we're gonna listen to him talk about this and I'm gonna get out an envelope. I'm gonna write his name on it. I'm gonna write a check. I'm gonna stick the check in and I'm going to see if he will uh, send a copy for me. Forming truths that have changed thousands and thousands of lives. That series contains it. You ought to get it if you don't have it. I believe it ought to be in every home and every church in America. They ought to hear this tape because it will help you understand what's going on beyond the surface. And we talked about that. We talked about the anesthetic effect that the hyper overstimulation of the body's glandular functions undergo when they are submitted to certain types of activity and certain types of music. In fact, this secular article out of the Houston Post came out the other day called, uh, it was entitled Lombada, called Threat to Health. Lombada is the latest dance. It is be just for the record, while I'm getting this envelope out with these stamps, let me just show you what the Lombada dance is, okay? So that we stop the fear mongering, let's just figure it out. Lombada dancing. Okay, here seems here's an example. Yeah, it's muted. Okay, let's see what let's see what we got going on here. Mom's dance is what it's called. Okay. So this is the Lombada dance right here. Yeah, satanic. Super satanic, this uh, Lombada dance. You can just feel the Satanism dripping off of these people. It's wrong. Wrong, guys. Need to do something about the Lombada dance at this yoga class. It's too much. We as a society cannot put up with this Lombada dance, okay? Unacceptable. In front of Wuni, uh, Wunu, wait, Wuno Pito? That's like my favorite place to eat, okay? You can't just do that in front of Wuno Pito. Bandar Undara? No, Udara, Bandar Udara Wunupito. You can't just do that, okay? Now I can't even eat there anymore. Anyway, there you go. There is our Lambata dance that this guy is screeching about at the top of his lungs like a screech owl. Now, while I fill out this envelope with his address, let's continue listening to him complain about dancing. I tried the, uh, <clears throat> I tried the phone number. It seems to be out of service, sadly. I really hope that his, he still has the same address. You know what? Just for good measure, so let me just double check the phone number he scrolled by. What was it? It was 1-800. Let's call it together. 1-800-829 word w o r d all right let's call together
This call may be recorded for quality assurance. We have a special promotion today for select callers. If you are over 50, please press 1 now. If not, press 2. You know what? Let's do it. Yeah, I don't want special promotion. If you are over 50, please press 1 now. If not, press 2. Hello and congratulations. Just for calling today, we're offering you a free medical alert device. You know. Oh my god, dude. Come on. In case of an emergency. These devices are often very expensive, so press 1 now to take advantage of this special offer and enjoy the peace of mind that comes with 24/7 support. Don't wait. Press 1 now or remain on the line for additional options. Again, press 1 now to claim your free device. Is this like an old person medical thing that we're dealing with? Is that what this is? If you are currently enrolled in Medicare Part A and Part B and want to review your plan options, which may include additional plan benefits, and check your eligibility for the enrollment period, please press 1 now. If you have Medicare Part A and Part B for your health insurance, or if you are new to Medicare, aging in, losing coverage, or recently moved and are interested in learning about the plan options, which may include additional plan benefits, press 1 now to review Medicare Advantage plans that may be available in your area or remain on the line for additional options. I'm waiting. Again, press 1 now to see the light. Maybe if I hit 0. Just let me talk to zero. Thank you for calling. This is Jessica on a recorded line. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Great. So uh, with our promotion today, you actually have the opportunity to receive a free medical alert device. So congratulations. Um, you know, it's that little button you wear around your neck that you press in case of an emergency or um, even a fall. Now, when you're participating in our monitoring program, um, you actually can get your medical alert absolutely free. So uh, oftentimes it's really expensive to buy a device like this. So um, we make it really simple for you. We pay for the entire unit itself and then ship it right to your house for free. And then She's literally saying knowing nothing I didn't already hear. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, let's go ahead and get you some more info on it, okay? Oh, that sounds good, but that's okay. I don't need that. Actually, I was wondering, I saw this old, um, this this sermon by Phil Arms, and this phone number came across the screen to order his uh, series, and I was wondering if that's if this is still the place I go to order his stuff. I'm sorry, you've reached the Medical Alert Center. Oh, my mistake. Unfortunately, we're unable to assist you any further, but uh, just for calling in today, you have the opportunity to receive a special gift. So um, just please stay on the line while I transfer your call. Thanks. Okay, that was a waste of time. Now let's see if we can get uh let's see what was it? It was um Rock of Ages versus the Age of Rock. Receive the tape set. Visa or MasterCard. Or write Phil Arms. All right. Let's see. Phil Arms, Pasadena, P A S A D E N A, Pasadena, Texas, seven seven five zero one. Wait, that's not a complete address. He didn't give us a complete address. I want a copy of this, okay? We're going to find a copy. We will find how we will figure this out. Oh, he's in he's in Houston now apparently. Open corporates. <clears throat> Involuntary dissolution. Involuntarily dissolved. Wow, that's really sad. Am I not going to be able to find this dude? Wait, is he dead? Don't tell me Phil Arms is dead. 
Top 10 best gun shops in Pasadena. Wow, great. Thank you. Um, what's this one? I'm just looking through here. All right, let, let me try typing Pastor Phil Arms. Phil Arms Ministries in Pasadena. <clears throat> this is under a under a thing called great loss where did his copyrights go man i have my checkbook out and everything i fear i'm not going to be able to get a copy of this dancing thing that he's talking about no i don't think this is him this picture all right let me just scroll over so you, you guys can see what i'm looking at too This doesn't look like this doesn't look like Phil Arms, does it? Hold on. Let me see. There should be some way to I should be able to like splice these together, but th it's not letting me. All right, let me just try blowing this up. No, it's not going to let me. Damn it. Yeah, there we are. Okay. This doesn't look like Phil Arms, does it? Totally different person, right? All right, let's look for obituaries. I got to get to the bottom of this. Oh, right here, right here. This is a 14 minute long video. This is a 10, one, 10 minute long one that I have. I'm downloading this video instead. Apparently they have four additional minutes to this video that I did not have. Converting. Philip Arms obituary, obituary 2008. They should have a picture of the guy, right? Dr. Phil Arms Jr.? No, that can't be the same guy. Doesn't seem like a doctor to me. That's not him. Um, I'm desperate to find information about Phil Arms. What happened to Phil Arms? He just disappeared off the face of the planet. No obituary, no nothing. When was he even born? What am I looking at right now? What is this? Dallas, Texas. No, that could be the dude's got uh, the dude's dad, maybe. Is it the same guy? The different haircut? 1939, died 2015. Arms, John Philip John was born in 39 in New Orleans, Texas, or I'm sorry, L.A. Passed away in 2015, survived by his wife, Barbara Cothern, or Cothern Arms, and his children, Cheryl Pioli. Uh, reflection of his faith in Jesus Christ. Many lives were touched through his involvement in teaching, coaching, Redeemer, Bible Church, and Watermark Community Church. John served 28 years in U.S. Marines, retiring as a colonel. Services be held October 2nd, Redeemer Church. Um, contributions can be made in, in lieu of flowers. To coach's outreach. This may be him. Maybe he died. I can't tell. Man, that's a shame. I really hope he didn't die. But he kind of fell off the face of the planet. I was all ready to give the dude 25 bucks. And there doesn't seem to be like any indication of... Houston Church. Wait. 
Houston Church, Pasadena, Texas address, Bill Arms. He died. Youth Reach Houston is what it was called. I think the dude died. The world will never know why dancing was so evil. That's um, that's actually crushing. That's a that is a crushing loss. I'm really sad to hear that. But you know what? We might as well laugh at his take on dancing while we're at it. Why not? Right. And it's so plug this in. <clears throat> and its sociological as well as physiological effect. And I discovered some alarming truths that have changed thousands and thousands of lives. That series contains it. You ought to get it if you don't have it. I believe it ought to be in every home and every church in America. They ought to hear this tape because it will help you understand what's going on beyond the surface. And we talked about that. We talked about the anesthetic effect that the hyper overstimulation of the body's glandular functions undergo when they are submitted to certain types of activity and certain types of music. In fact, that sounds serious. That's real. The body undergoes certain glandular changes and, and modifications after listening to certain types of music and doing certain dances oh boy this sounds like jehovah's witnesses take on dancing hey let me pull up my book i wrote about it in my book owenmorgan.com slash book if you're curious by the way but yeah here it is here it is um Hold on. Sorry, I'm just looking for the right page here. All right, here, here we go. So just from my book, I'm reading like about the, the dancing and, and how Jehovah's Witnesses felt about it at the same time as Phil Arms, by the way. Dancing back then was the wokeism of its time or the DEI or the whatever, you know. Jehovah's Witnesses have even addressed dancing. Here's a quote from a July 1st, 1962 Watchtower. Quote, Many of the news reports will likely have a few words about the origin of a new dance, and this is true of the twist. Time Magazine, for instance, commented, The twist is at first an innocent enough dance. It has been since the largely discarded... In Wait, I'm sorry. It has been... It's been largely discarded in favor of such refinements as the roach and the fly. Knowing Jehovah's Witnesses, they put those names in there on purpose. I don't know of any dance named the roach or the fly. But the point is to make it seem disgusting to you. Dancing is disgusting. Trying to link those two words in your head. But the youngsters at a certain New York nightclub have revived the twist and parodied it into a replica of some ancient tribal puberty rite. The dancers scarcely ever touch each other or move either feet. Everything else, however, moves. The upper body sways either... Wait. The upper body sways forward and backward, and the hips and shoulders twirl erotically, while the arms thrust in, out, up, and down. Jehovah's Witnesses, Watchtower, July 1st, 1962, Pages 409 to 414. So anyway, yeah, later in the article, they demonize the twist specifically. In this example, we've found that the dance craze mainly involves bodily gyrations. Boy, that's a scary word, gyration. Bodily gyrations. I know, I'm sorry for traumatizing you with that word. And that the words used to describe them are frantic, sensual, and erotic. You've also learned what kind of person developed the dance. Tribal puberty rights, of course. 
and that it basic and that it's basically an imitation of some pagan tribes dance involving gestures of a sexually suggestive nature that was the uh uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? That was kind of the sentiment, the feel around the time about dancing. Young people were doing it, and that was absolutely unacceptable. See, there's something called the euphemism treadmill in society. And it doesn't, like, euphemism, euphemisms apply to words specifically, but it doesn't just have to apply to words necessarily. The euphemism treadmill... Um, in the context of words specifically, refers to how certain words become really offensive and are just not used anymore by people because they're so offensive, like the N-word, for example. And they're deprecated until they're just like, we don't, you know, no one ever uses them anymore. No one ever talks about them or hears about the words or anything, and it, it, we just move on. Good example is the word gongoozler from the 19... Uh, 20s? Yeah, that one is from the 1920s. Gun Goozler. Or the term digging it. It's not offensive. It's just like not used. I'm digging it, you know? That's from the uh, 1970s. Nobody says that anymore. Nobody. So anyway, the point that I'm getting to is that applies to more than just the euphemism treadmill, more than just words. People get bent out of shape about actions, and then they move on to something new. You know, they get bent, bent out of shape about dancing, and then they just suddenly stop caring, like nobody gives a shit. And that's where we are now, the not give a shit mode. It's completely irrelevant to everybody around us. Like everyone recognizes dancing is not like causing, I don't know, some evil tribal puberty right to be revived and then Satan comes along. Blah, blah, blah. None of that is true. It was all made up all along. So all the way back then, the fear mongering campaign was dancing and it's just kind of been deprecated today. These people are a joke. This secular article out of the Houston Post secular article came out the other day called uh, it was entitled lombada called threat to hell lombada yeah so i think we played the lombada dance right a second ago and it's just some stupid dance that like yoga teachers do that is the latest dance it is a sexual dance it's nothing but having sex with your clothes on to me it's not it's just people dancing bro come on Music, but anyway is that what you think that's what sex is really you know that tells me something about you more than anything that's sad i feel bad for this dude's wife honestly it's out of uh, the houston chronicle and it says taiwan doctors are warning trendy young people to think twice before joining the lombada dance craze taiwan doctors you're noticing the weasel words in this He's not telling us which Taiwan doctors. He's not telling us what qualifications they have to make those claims. Not giving us any information about that. He's just saying Taiwan doctors. That is a wild name for a guy, right? First name Taiwan, last name doctors. Makes him really hard to track down, though. Which promotes, which promoters are advertising as the forbidden dance. The United Daily News on Thursday said doctors had found the Lombada's sinuous Brazilian rhythms and close body contact could cause, quote, excessive blood flow in males, which could very possibly cause them to become dysfunctional. Except, you know what? Yeah, I've heard that. Blood flow in males makes them become dysfunctional. Yeah, you don't want any blood flow. You want zero, ideally. Just you, in fact, you know what? In an ideal world, that we wouldn't even have a heart, our blood would be completely stationary. If we, you know, if I could have it my way, everyone's heart would be stationary and there'd be zero blood flow so that we wouldn't be dysfunctional at all. Doctors have also warned young women about the dance, saying it leads to abnormal sexual relations between dancing partners and should not be attempted without 
prior counseling. B without prior counseling. Oh boy, this is serious, huh? I already hear what he's about to say. And this is the secular media saying this. Yeah, I bet. It totally. It was a time it was the New York Times announcing all this stuff, right? And you're just reporting what they're reporting. It's funny, I've never known like the New York Times to use weasel words, for example. Like real reporters don't use weasel words. They protect their sources from time to time, but they will explain who they is before they say the word they. They'll explain they refers to like the source that I'm talking to or whatever. Again, secular analysis saying these things. How did I guess? The Lombada has hit Taiwan after sweeping Europe and the United States. Three different Lombada movies are now showing in Taiwan cinemas. Lombada movies? What movie could possibly be made about a dance? Aside from Dirty Dancing. The never-ending... Um, no, let me rephrase the timeless movie dirty dancing where that 30 year old guy got with like a 16 year old and everybody was just okay with it so even the world understands that there are uh, sexual appetites and drives that are even the world stirred when you involve yourselves in certain things we have discussed basically the music we've discussed discussed the message and the philosophy we did that in that Rock of Ages series as well as part one of the... God, I wish I could get my hands on this stuff. Rock of Ages. I want to know what he thinks about heavy metal. I'm so desperate. How do I give this guy my money? I want him to have my money. Please take my money and give me your Rock of Ages series. I'm begging you. I think the dude's dead, sadly. Just such a shame series that we're talking about today and i pray that you get it if you hadn't got it gotten it you know i'm trying the most important principle that i could share with you today as a christian and i realize some of you aren't and so you can just you know check out because what i'm about to tell you doesn't have a doesn't do a bit of good unless you know the lord jesus christ as your personal savior but if you're going to live for jesus and if you're going to be an overcomer paul tells you that you have got to gird up the loins of your mind Gird up, boys. Gird up your loins and fill your horns with oil. Now, what that means is, is you must place guards about your mind. You must aggressively set up gates about what you allow to touch your mind and your emotions. The Bible says you must guard your mind. We concluded in this. Okay, I don't know. Have I don't have any idea what he's re even referring to here. But okay, fine first part of this series that dancing and if you weren't here for the first first part just take my word for it i get the tape one that dancing along i'm trying man along with any other social activity in and of itself is not amoral in other words it's not neutral why because everything is spirit say that everything is spirit you must learn that so literally every single thing that i ever do ever is somehow linked to jesus or Satan, one or the other. And if I'm not doing something Jesus-related, then I'm doing something Satan-related by default, okay? Everything going on in this world is, in fact, the closer we get to the last days, the more spiritual everything is becoming. And this dancing, this social activity we discovered had behind it demonic powers that were, that were designed for the purpose of seduction and to deaden spiritual awareness. I read an article called Dance is America's Number One Amusement, and it listed about how many of the percentage of young people, singles, and adults were involved. It was phenomenal. I didn't keep the article, but the vast majority of... I didn't keep the article, he says. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? Wow. How super ultra convenient is that, that he didn't keep the article as proof? Americans are at some way, in somehow, in some fashion, have their lives tied to the social activity of dancing. And it does not leave them unaffected. It is an activity that men use, that, that scripture said, or that, that article said, for amusement. 
It's interesting to know. Wow, amusement is absolutely unacceptable. We can't have that. That's bad. Amusement? No way. But the Greek word for, for think is to muse. Amuse means not to think. And we live in a society that does not want to think. We so being amused is bad, is what he just said. The Greek word muse means to think. I don't even know if that's true, but let's just take him at his word for a second. Greek word muse means to think. And the word amuse uh, with the prefix a, which the, the prefix a means not or without. So if you add the prefix a to the word muse, amuse, then it means to not think. Okay, I don't, I, again, I don't know if that's true. That sounds completely fabricated, but you know what? Okay, let's just take it. Sometimes people like to shut their brains off and not deal with anything. You ever consider that one? Never ever, ever knock that one around the old noggin, Phil? No, he doesn't care. He wants you to be a radical extremist in favor of Jesus. We live in a society that does not want to engage our brain. We live in an age of television and computers and stereos. And we don't, the gall. don't want to make our minds activated because I'm afraid when some of us start thinking, we get fearful and anxious and frustrated with what we're thinking about because most don't have solutions. They can't come to proper conclusions in their life. So we don't want to think. In fact, I was researching something not long ago when I was in a library, and the librarian recognized me and began to talk to me. She said, I've been a teacher for X number of years. She said, we have dis just discovered that the average attention span of the average young person is now four to five minutes. That, okay, go on. And so they're having to redo their curriculums in the public schools to, to engage the minds of children for that time span and then give them a kind of a break and go at it again. Wow, that's messed up that we would have to change to adapt to society, huh? Wow, the gall. I want things to be completely the same 100% of the time. Aside from that, this is just made up. This is fabricated. This is not true. The attention span was never four to five minutes. The attention span is roughly the same as it's always been, which is about 17 seconds. Always. That's just how human brains have always worked but okay literally never a time when our attention span was four to five minutes if a person is eager to walk with god you must not ask the question what's wrong with dancing or what's wrong with smoking or what's wrong with cussing or what's wrong with premarital sex if that's the way you ask your question you're asking it the wrong way you need to ask yourself, when you come to a decision about what you're going to involve yourself in, is what is right with this? What there you go. And that's really the crux of the, uh, the argument here, isn't it? He wants people to believe that there's nothing you should... Uh, all right, let me phrase. He wants people to feel that there's nothing you should do ever unless it is specifically to serve God, period. No questions asked. Do you get do you get the idea about his dancing craze? Let's listen to his little Pokemon video here. It's short. Pocket monster. Pokemon is Pokemon, plural, are incredible creatures that share the world with humans. Each has his own fighting abilities. Some grow and evolve into even more powerful creatures. Uh, I'm waiting for the bad part here. The children are developing relationships. With all these Pokemon creatures, a little... Well, that's not exactly right, but you know what? I'm waiting for the bad part here. Reclusive, power-filled monsters. But wh why should they carry these monsters in their pocket? They say the Pokemon whole uh, effort is to train children how to become the number one Pokemon... No, 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 you misunderstood, Phil. Probably because you didn't read the fucking article. The Pokemon ma or the uh, the Pokemaniac or I don't know what you'd call him. the person who's into Pokemon. His whole goal is to become a Pokemon master by get by catching them all, by getting them all, right, and by 
showing them love and appreciation. Master in the world. You follow it through the New Age teaching, you find out that masters are those who... Uh... Wait, why are we following it to the New Age teaching? What does this have to do with New Age anything? I'm lost. Take control of spirits in the dark realm, and they tell those spirits what to do. The child at some point becomes capable of taking these powers and channeling them through their mind, through their arms, or through their power sources. Okay, and do you have any evidence of this? Has this literally ever happened in the history of ever? Has a kid ever shot a flame through his arm at an enemy or whatever? Or are you just completely fabricating this out of the ether? Because I'm going to guess it's the latter. Their power sources, of course, are many of the symbols that they pick up from the Pokemon paraphernalia. So, so Pokemon is a game that teaches children how to enter into the world of witchcraft, how to cast spells, how to use psychic phenomena, how to put to work supernatural powers against their enemies, how to fantasy role play. Pokemon world is a world of the demonic. How to fantasy role play. Can you imagine? My God, our children learning this of the satanic. But while you might not take it quite seriously... No, I don't. I assure you that demons take it quite seriously. Satan takes it quite seriously. Your children knew, need to know there's a devil, and he hates them, and he wants to ruin their life. Uh, there was even a couple of reports where children had been stabbed by other children over Pokemon cards. Do you remember the... Uh, oh, is there a, uh, a story of that happening? Where? Where did this happen, Phil? Tell me where this happened and who did it exactly. Where can I find information on this? Because for some reason, I'm prone not to believe a word out of your mouth. Dungeons and Dragons game of the 80s where uh, children, young people even ended up killing themselves because it was a role-playing game. Our kids are going out in gangs on the streets and they're so used to killing each other in their fantasy games and on their video screens and... Like in Dungeons and Dragons. People are so used to killing each other in Dungeons and Dragons. Blowing each other away and blowing each other up that when they walk down the streets and they pull out their 45 and they pump some friend full of bullets, they kind of think in the back of their mind, well, they're just going to, we'll turn off the machine and they'll get up and they'll be there tomorrow and I'll shoot them again. It's just a game. To which okay, that's, yeah. Okay, that's never happened literally in the history of ever. I have no idea what he's going on about. But again, this is demonizing Pokemon. This is part of the Pokemon craze of the 1990s. This is the fear that pastors built into people. You know, society wants to make progress. They want to have fun. They, they want to create something new and novel and interesting. They want to entertain people. They want to whatever. There's, there is the church every time standing in the way finding some way to put a stop to it, to make this more difficult, to make it miserable. It's, it's absurd. It's a joke. These people are jokes. Does Phil Arms realize that he is a joke of a human being? Did he realize before, I assume, he died? Or does he just, like, not even know? Is he unaware of the fact that people view him that way? I have to wonder. I respond, Russian roulette is just a game. Russian roulette is the same as Pokemon. But they're so into this make-believe world that they can't distinguish between fantasy and real. Listen, I can't stress this enough. Stress it, Phil. Now that everything in life is real. Everything. Well, no, it's not, actually. There are some things that are on a video screen. Phil Arms has been dead for who knows how long, and he's on a video screen, he's not real. What are you talking about? I assure you, what your children watch, what you watch affects you radically. That's true to some degree. Some things affect people deeply that, um, and they, they affect, it affects them negatively um, at certain ages at the very least, but it's Pokemon, okay? It is the most vanilla game imaginable. Are people here today, they can't get saved. Don't think he's dead. He wrote a book four years ago. 
I need to find out if he's I, I need to find out if he's still active in around if he is I want a copy of this stuff man I need to figure this out hold on um Phil Arms, the man who would be God, Satan's final rebellion, 2020. Is this Phil Arms? I think this might be Phil Arms. You can look at uh, Phil Arms' uh, biography, I believe. And his other books written. This other book he wrote, Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse. They really are breaking down the walls. This dude's totally a Trump supporter today, right? No doubt about it. He's only written two books. Really? How do I contact Phil? I want his stuff. I could go through the trouble of looking up the ISBN number and then searching, do a, doing a business search based off of that. This is written in 97, and the other is 2020. Dude, I think this guy's still alive. Okay, let me do an ISBN search. Um... All right, the ISBN number for Phil Arms' book. He doesn't... Hold on. Oh, here we go. I think this is it. Yes, this is it. Okay, I've got it. Yes, Arms Phil. Phil Arms Ministries. Then this is written 97. But there's no um, Phil Arms Ministries. Okay. I got to find this out. I got to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, I think I, I think I found an address. Although it says involuntary disillusion. Hold on. Phil Arms Ministries, Thompson's, Texas. 1974 is when it started. Got an EIN number. Got a P.O. box. Um... Somebody just sent me Phil Arms contact info. Van Briggs sent me contact info. Hold on. Uh, let's see. Richmond, Texas. Let's give it a call. Let's see if we can figure this out. Let's get to the bottom of this. Hold on. 281-937-9690. Let's, let's see if we can figure it out. Hold on. What? Did it not work? What the hell is happening? Sorry, you have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. If you have reached this recording in error, please check the area code and number and try your call again. That's really sad. All right, well, you know what? I'm not going to send him money. 
But I am going to write a letter. That's how preachers back then did it, right? Oh my god, my filing cabinet is becoming unwieldy. Okay, I got a letter thing or my jigger here. And I know preachers back then really appreciated handwritten letters, right? So we'll give him what he's looking for. A handwritten letter requesting his... Oop, God, my chair just got all messed up. Requesting his Rock of Ages series and maybe his Pokemon series and definitely his dancing series. <clears throat> Dear Pastor... Phil Arms, I saw one of your videos on, oh, by the way, I'm writing in cursive, which makes it even, you know, better for him, videos on Pokemon in church today and I was hoping you could Tell me how to purchase your Rock of Ages and dancing series thanks so much for the consideration Owen Morgan Okay, fold this puppy up. Looks like a second grader wrote it because I don't write very often. I usually type. I was typing the message. That's okay. All right. Folded. I'm putting it in an envelope. Okay, envelope is sealed. All right, now what's the address we got here? Phil Arms, Life Reach Ministries. Phil Arms, Life Reach Ministries. And that's uh, 436 Carroll Road. 436 Carroll Road. And then we got Richmond, Texas. Richmond, Texas. 77469. Okay. I'll write my uh, return address down now.
I hate writing. I hate it with like nothing else. With a burning passion of a thousand hot suns. All right. New York. New York. Okay. Now I'm going to put a stamp on this puppy. And I'm going to mail it out today with... And I'm going to mail it out today with... Maybe you can't see. Can you see? I'm not sure. Yeah. I have a bunch of books and stuff behind me that I was working on, get you know, preparing to ship. I put labels on all of them and everything. Got to bring them to the post office now. Drop them in the drop box so that they'll ship. <clears throat> Nericle, I assume you're here. I got to yours, and I put a little message in. Even though you paid, you did not pay for a message, I put one in there anyway. Okay, we got a stamp. Oh my god, everything's falling apart. Okay, we've got it. We got it. I'm shipping that puppy out with everything else. Who knows? Maybe we'll get a response from Mr. Phil Arms. That would be... I would be so happy if we got like a... You know, if we got a copy of Rock of Ages and or the dancing fear mongering nonsense or the Pokemon stuff. Oh, my God. I want this stuff in its entirety. I want it so badly. Some of you can. Oops, sorry. Hang on. Let me fix this. Go to heaven. There we go. OK, step back. Some of you can't go to heaven. What, what you do with your brain has a direct correlation of where you're going to spend eternity. But you know, the media in this country, uh, whether it's, listen, rock music, whether it's the perverted primetime programming and cable programming and the movie industry, whatever. And now the Internet. The Internet. Can you imagine the gall of the Internet existing? Oh, that's the end. That's the end of it. Everything terrible. Anyway. <sighs> These people need help for real. Tell me what you think about this in the comments and cross your fingers that I get a response. If I get a response, you can bet your bottom dollar I'm going to be playing it on air of talking about it. Even a response, even if it's not Rock of Ages or, you know, a Dirty Dancing. I don't know what he calls his stupid dancing series or whatever but yeah tell me what you think in the comments this is fascinating to me right, i'm gonna take a short break when you come back oh yeah it's not it's not podcast night. let me set this all right i wanted to talk about stephen dollins for a while but shit hold on um You know what? I might as well just talk about this short Stephen Dolan's thing. Hold on. Uh, where is it? This is the one. No, that's not the one. This is it. It's it's short. Just take a few seconds. This is Stephen Dolan's. He's who I call the Pokey Man. And he bought right into the Pokemon craze back in the 90s. Listen to what he has to say here. Pokemon. Pocket Monster. The Spiral. And it stands for what? Male Fertility. It's supposed to be able to mesmerize and hypnotize its enemies. This character over here is called Mewtwo. Every time that you see Mewtwo, he's in this pose. Three fingers. It means Hail Satan. 
I love it, dude. I love everything about it. It's so ridiculously stupid. It makes me laugh so hard. Anyway, uh, yeah. That's the level that we're dealing with back then. Right back in the 90s. These pastors have not gotten less ridiculous. Trust me. They're just as ridiculous, if not more so, about different subjects. In 30 years, we're going to look back at this era in time right now and think to ourselves, they really said that shit about trans people? Oh my God, that's crazy. Cute little one. Everybody, okay, everybody go, oh, come on. His tail. It's a lightning bolt. And it's a satanic Z. Really? How can you possibly watch this and believe a word out of this guy's mouth, honestly? Anyway, these people are insane. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. All right, let me reset the camera here. All right, let's talk about some stuff while playing a game. Kill the recording here. Um, let's see here. I wonder how often that um, that lifeline place or whatever gets phone calls asking about Phil Arms and his ministry. Is that often you think? They seemed mad when I asked. Um, all right, here we go. All right, let me close all the uh, fill arms tabs here. What is this? Oh, this is Phil Arms. Well, I'm about to dance. I don't know what the hell. This, what am I looking at? What is this? Oh. Ah, uh, Wisdom of Peterson. I better keep that up. All right, you know what? Let's uh, well, let's watch a little bit more of this. Um, base your secular thoughts on empirical facts. See what else we got. I'm just looking through like their subjects here. Uh, we don't all use the same currency. Negotiation techniques, bottom-up learning, parenting and relationships. We screwed up during the pandemic. Hell, last you could figure this one out. Mediocrity, no, mediocrity. No, I'm sorry, meritocracy versus the fringe. The psychopathy of virtualization. The obvious contagion effect of transgenderism. Oh, wow. Well, that's an option. We can watch that one. Let me just see. Hang on. <clears throat> Close second is Flashpoint. Let's see what we got going on here. Yeah, nothing super interesting on Flashpoint. All right, let's watch Peterson. Right, this is Jordan Peterson. If you're unfamiliar, he's a far right nutcase. And um, Phil McGraw on the right, famous for having a TV show where he got drill sergeants in to scare the bejesus out of kids and convince them that what they were doing was wrong. FYI, if he were involved in the psychology, all right, let me put it this way. If he took the psychology experts seriously to any degree, if he took the literature seriously at all, he wouldn't have been doing scare tactics on its on his show ever. 
Because scare tactics don't work, period. But that's neither here nor there. These two fine-looking gentlemen are here to discuss... What is it they're going to discuss? Let's see. Sexual identity is not who you are. And um, the obvious contagion effect of transgenderism. That's what they're going to discuss. I'm not even joking. So let's listen to what these people have to say. It's absolutely absurd from top to bottom, as I'm sure you know. I have a degree in psychology as well. Not as high as these guys, but I do have a degree. So let's see what they have to say. And while we do, we're going to play some Breath of the Wild 2, Tears of the Kingdom, just kind of running around doing whatever. So shouldn't bother you too much. All right, let's give this a listen. Our society. and then oh, Step back to the beginning of this. Yeah, here we go. I'm, the reason I'm asking you the, that question or and, and pre presenting those possibilities is because the question of who you are, that's the question of identity, is begged by your first principle. You know, when people are saying now that... You know, he's talking about first principle. So Dr. Phil wrote, or let me rephrase, Phil wrote a book where he has 10 principles of life that everybody should follow, basically. Not dissimilar from Jordan Peterson's 12 rules of life or something to that effect. I can't find them outside of his stupid book, so... Um, you know, I'm not buying a stupid book just to read those 10 principles. But anyway, uh, yeah, let's keep listening with that in uh, with that in mind. I think they're referencing the uh, principles there. You know, identity is begged by your first principle. You know, when people are saying now that they're their sexual identity, right? That's the biggest claim in, in our society. And that they... Mm, no, I think people are saying their sexual identity is different from the one that you believe it to be. They're not saying that they are their sexual identity. But okay. They should be proud of that claim. Sustainable. And then you can start doing that on purpose. Now, I'm, the reason I'm asking you the, that question or and, and pre presenting those possibilities is because the question of who you are, that's the question of identity, is begged by your first principle. You know, when people are saying now that they're their sexual identity, right? That's the biggest claim in, in our society and that they should be proud of that claim. And to Well, I mean, people should be proud of who they are. Yes, absolutely. I want people to be proud of who they are. I want people to be happy with who they are and not feel like pieces of trash because you told them to. I want people to be who they are and be happy with it. Any psychologist would say that. Be happy with who you are. There are a couple of, you know, little errors here or there that are that need to be addressed and we will address them, but you need to accept who you are and not be down on yourself 24/7. Now, what the hell are these guys saying? They are directly contradicting psychology by saying this stuff. Okay, go on. To me, that just reduces who someone is to, well, to essentially to a very unidimensional biological drive that seeks immediate gratification. Okay, well, that's incorrect, good sir. I simply disagree with you. Seems we're at an impasse. What do we do now? Look to the scientific literature, you think, maybe? Do you think that could help us get to, like, real factual information if we looked at facts? This guy has no idea what he's talking about. None. And his followers don't realize that, seemingly. I'm talking Jordan Peterson. They don't seem to know that he's completely full of shit. It's a very low-order conception of who you are. So when you say be who you are on purpose, what do you think you're pointing to in that who you are? Uh, I don't understand the question, but you know what? Okay, go on. You know, I think it is a much harder question than people anticipate when they begin, which is why I say you've got to really sit down and think about this. Because when you ask somebody, tell me who you are, and you cannot use your occupation or what you spend most of your time doing um, in the answer. If I take that away from them, like if you're an accountant, 
that's what you do all day, 50, 60 hours a week. And I say, tell me who you are, and you can't use your occupation in the answer. It's astounding to me how people struggle because they identify themselves with labels. And, yeah. you know, I'm an accountant or I'm a, I'm a welder or a welder's helper. Um, and now, as, as you say, a, a lot of people have uh, adopted a cause. And so they put that like they want to tattoo it on their forehead. That's not who they and are. And sometimes do. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, this is stupid. Actually, uh, but that's not who they are. Who they are is multidimensional. It cuts across intrapersonal, interpersonal, uh, spiritual, uh, familial. It, it cuts across a lot of different levels. Okay, here's the thing about Dr. Phil. I'm not, I shouldn't even be calling him a doctor. Um, he's not a practicing psychologist, to my knowledge, up to this moment. But either way, I, I, you know what? I suppose he got a doctorate degree, so whatever. Anyway, Phil, the thing about Phil is he's giving real, actual, legitimate psychology principles. The things that he says that are in line with psychology are on point. He's absolutely correct. Yes, it would be really, really helpful and valuable to people to think about who they are. When they close their eyes at the end of the night, and there's nobody there but them in the darkness. Who are they? You know, we have something called an inner monologue. And the inner monologue is basically that voice that gives you information. Like, say I tell you, think of it, the name of a city. Any city in the entire world. Any. Let me give you five seconds. Think about it. What city did you think of? Did that city have anything to do with the state that you're in right now or the country that you're in right now? Why didn't you pick Cairo? You know that Cairo is a city. Why didn't you pick Cairo? It came to you almost unbidden, like you didn't request it. You didn't ask for it. It's just there. This concept came from uh, Sam Harris, by the way. There's an inner monologue that we don't control. Similarly, a treatment for seizures used to be, or maybe still is, I'm not sure, uh, severing the connection between your left brain and your right brain, basically sawing your brain in half. And people were fine. They come out of there and they're just fine. But now they, on occasion, have something called alien hand syndrome, where they'll be walking through a grocery store and, you know, be bopping along, getting their groceries or whatever, and next thing they know... Cinnamon Toast Crunch has been grabbed by their right hand and is sitting in their cart. Well, they don't remember grabbing Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It had nothing to do with that. What happened? They walk by the milk aisle and their right hand will just go nuts grabbing whatever it wants. It's because fundamentally they're... Fundamentally, the conscious brain is the CEO of the system, there are a lot of underlying processes that work between there and the CEO of the system, the, the conscious mind. We don't know, or let me rephrase, we know what choice we're going to make, even if we make a split second decision. We know what choice we're going to make a whole six seconds before we make it on average. So the point is that who the, the person doing the thinking is not you. 
You are not the one making the decisions. Cairo or, you know, um, Portland or wh whatever city came to mind was not chosen by you. It was chosen by your unconscious mind. It made that choice. You just, you know, it came to your mind. It was like it was spoken to you, like somebody got in your ear and whispered it to you. And you said, oh, all right, I'll pick that one. Why not? That is how the unconscious mind works. Now, back to what Phil was saying here. Uh, interpersonal, interpersonal, uh, spiritual, uh, familial. It, it cuts across a lot of different levels. And I think it comes down to um, a, a real heavy, if, you, if you're doing a weighted equation... Who are you? Who are you? He says you're a combination of, uh, well, it cuts across a variety of different areas, um, familial and, and all kinds of other things. Who are you is not as simple an answer as people would think it is. That's the point that I'm trying to get to here. And people don't really know who they are unless they really give it some thought. Unless they really evaluate their values and ideals and beliefs and feelings and everything. So, anyway, I thought it was an interesting little uh, rabbit hole to go down. You have to give heavy weight to what they believe and what they're passionate about. And if in that description, there's not something in there that they're really passionate about, uh, I, I really say, wow, you, you I, I would encourage you to seek that passion uh, because I, I think going through life without a passionate pursuit, man, that's got to look like nine miles of bad road. I, I mean, you're just... Yeah, you got to find something that keeps you going, that keeps you interested in, in life and everything. I agree. Got to keep something to keep the, uh, or you got to do something to keep the old noggin jogging, if you will. Yeah, yeah. You're just pushing a rock up a slippery hill. If you're not passionate, if you're passionate about something, then all of a sudden work becomes something that you 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 want to do it becomes something it's it may be your your work and your your vocation and your avocation can't be the same thing but if you ever hit that uh you, you've won the you've won the lottery if you love what you do enough yeah that's me you've won the lottery absolutely if you love what you do enough to not hate it with every fiber of your being that's me i like what i do I mean, it's a lot of work. I put a lot of time in. Oh, my God. hundred hours sometimes. But I do love it to death. That it's, it's both your vocation and your avocation. And, and right. Well, I think, that's the, I think that's the fortunate circumstance that you find yourself in when you align what could otherwise just be whim with, with a higher order calling. And I think the traditionally- uh, What the hell does that, when you order whim with a higher order calling, what do you mean by that, Jordan? What the hell does that mean? It's completely nonsensical. Insistence, you know, there's a traditional insistence that the spirit of God is the divinity in calling, right? And, and you're pointing to that. The spirit of God is the divinity in calling, what? That doesn't make any sense. You're, you're using secular language and likely purposefully, but your notion is that there are things that will interest and compel you in your life, and your job is to, that's the, that's the call of the treasure that the dragon guards. That's a good way of thinking about it. And that if you pursue that, that infuses your life with a kind of sustaining meaning. You know, when, when I wrote my first book, when I wrote Maps of Meaning, I wrote a chapter in that book called The Divinity of Interest, and it was really a paean to calling. And I knew it was incomplete, and, and so I want to run this by you because I think this is implicit in your principles too. You know, you say, for example, don't reward bad behavior or support conduct you do not value. That's number three. Um, do not stay silent just so others can remain 
comfortable actively live and support meritocracy those those seem to actively live and support meritocracy i'm like i'm not even sure what he means by that exactly me to be pointers to integrate conscience with calling right so can imagine that there's two mechanisms that orient you towards your higher realization okay i'm imagining let's put it that way one would be the calling that infuses your life with significance and meaning but it can go off track right it can become a, a delusional enthusiasm or a whim you need another countervailing force that's something like conscience and maybe that's the voice of integrated negative emotion you know the warning voice and so the calling says go this way and the conscience says yeah but stay on the path right don't don't well that's the thing that's an interesting thing about psychology right like when you let's say you're trying to lose weight right and you make a deal with yourself if i eat this cake today then i will not have this thing tomorrow or whatever who are you making a deal with exactly you're making a deal with you with the other part of who you are you are a you you are made up of multitudes you're made up of multiple different pieces multiple different beings thinking beings simultaneously that have different tasks that are good at different things one is an like kind of an automated system that jumps into action the moment it's ne the moment it's needed and the other is kind of an analytical type of deal there are a lot of different parts to a human being that make deals with each other and work together to accomplish a goal they all have a common goal and you the conscious ceo you are only getting the final result you know sometimes you're sitting here looking at, at cake making a deal with yourself that goes like this well i told myself that i wasn't going to eat this cake today because i had cake yesterday but you know what if i have cake today and yesterday then i don't have to cake then i don't have to have cake for two days and it just keeps going like that your automated systems are feeding you information and you are listening to them you have no choice practically very little choice to fight against them and there has to be a will to fight against them there has to be a system in there who's analytical and thinking and fighting against the automatic um the automatic system that's trying to force you to eat that cake anyway back to what we we're saying here don't be tempted by short-term callings stay on the path and watch keep yourself in check and so that seems to me to be manifested for example in this let's look at number six just briefly do not stay silent just so others you could say as well do not say stay silent just so others and yourself can remain what comfortable and you mean temporarily comfortable i would presume in that utterance as well yes. so the, the the question that begs is well look if i can stay silent and other people are comfortable he's using the question that begs incorrectly begging the question is a logical fallacy that has nothing to do with the situation but whatever then why shouldn't I stay silent? And so, so let's let's walk into that. What what's your sense of that? I feel like Dr. Phil actually does remember some of his Psych 101 courses, and is like contributing some of his uh, knowledge to his book or to the world from those Psych 101 classes, and. Jordan Peterson is completely lost in the weeds, has no idea what's going on, and is in nothing but like a coma, uh, a talking point coma. Has no clue what to say other than woke bad. Well, my sense of that is that 
you have a lot of people right now that are going to be uncomfortable if you call out some narratives that are being pushed on society that don't gel with your values, don't gel with your sense of of factual base and so you know what if somebody called out uh w what you call a narrative that doesn't gel with your sense of society or your logical base or whatever i want to know if something is not quite right in society i want to know i want that information available to me I want to understand if there's a real problem happening that needs to be dealt with. That's not what's happening. Trans people are a hated minority. They are not getting into the schools and brainwashing children or any of that other nonsense. These people have just eaten up that propaganda hook, line, and sinker. And will do whatever it takes to propagate that idea. Science. And that's why if you look at number four, measure all actions based on results and all thoughts based on rationality. And and you're, you're right. I'm, I'm describing these in secular terms on purpose. <clears throat> but And people think, well, rationality is not a word I use every day. So how can I use that? Uh, it's not. Rationality is not a word that I use every day. Really? Okay. Um, it's really very simple. Um, number one, is that thought based on verifiable fact? So, there you go. So if you have a thought, and and we tend to believe ourselves, right? I mean, if, if, if I put... Oh, yeah, I believe I'm the most logical, principled, intelligent actor on planet Earth. And if people would just go with what I say and do, the world would be a 50, it would be 15 times better than it is right now. But everybody believes that about themselves. They all believe they're the most rational actor, the most intelligent, and they know what's best for society. You put Jordan Peterson in a position of authority, you put him in the White House, for example and you let him do whatever it is he wants to do, he's going to believe that he's doing the right thing, by and large. We all think we're rational actors. We all think we're operating off of factual information. That's why we have to have a, a gauge to determine who is more correct. Put a blindfold on you and walk you around uh, downtown. Hold on. Send some other DMs with VHSs I found from Phil Arms. I'm sorry I provided incorrect info for Phil Arms. Hold on. Wait a minute. Let me just check the chat here. It's unavailable. Damn. Found when Satan touches a life by Phil Arms. Okay. Oh, God, I wish that VHS was available. How do I order one? Author Phil Arms. Van Brigg says, I'll keep looking. Okay, I appreciate that. I want this so bad. I'd like a book. That'd be nice, but I really want the tapes. I want the videos. Videos would be so good. There's a, holy shit, a $20 Kindle book here, apparently. It's $60. Wait. Interviews with American composers Barney Childs in conversation with Music in American Life, apparently. I'm just looking. 
Pokemon and Harry Potter, a fatal attraction. You know, that might actually be worth getting a copy. Can I get a copy of this? And can I translate this to English? How do I translate this to English? I'm trying to translate it so I can understand. Can I buy this? I don't understand how you translate this to English. I don't remember. It's translate in here. Yes, there is a translate option. Okay, hang on. Uh, wait. Oh, it's on eBay. When Satan touches a life. Oh, no way. No fucking way. Translate English. Okay, it looks like I can buy the book, Harry Potter and Pokemon. A fatal attraction. A supernatural battle is now raging for the minds and destinies of our children. This is a battle that can that parents can that parents can and must win. Violence, psychic manipulation, witchcraft, murder, demons, wizards, magic, Satanism, and the occult are but a few of the featured attractions in the world of the ever popular Pokemon phenomena and the celebrated Harry Potter series. Wow. All right, I'm adding this to my cart. And there's a Phil Arms thing here. When Satan touches a life. All right, I'm adding it to my cart. When Satan touches a life. Can I add it? Is it going to let me? Um, all right, continue with Zoan. Give me a second. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out if I can do this. What other things we got here? Big box VHS horror asylum of Satan, clamshell, blah, blah, blah. No. Cult Explosion, 1980s. Charles Manson, Occult something or other. I'd have to get a uh, VHS, like, um, what do you call it? Like a VHS converter, whatever. Uh, that's really interesting. Okay, I've added them to my list. When Satan Touches a Life by Phil Arms Ministries. Oh, I have an actual address now. P.O. Box 299, Thompson's, Texas. And I have a phone number. Wait a minute. Wait. Let me try calling this phone number real quick. We got nine six seven three. All right, let's see if this is Phil Arms. This call may be recorded for quality assurance. We have a special promotion today for select callers. If you are over fifty, please press. That same stupid thing. That's a shame. Damn. If we can find a copy of this stuff, I'm getting it. Absolutely. Let me know if you guys can find a copy of this stuff. I would love to have a copy of the whole thing. All right, let's continue on. Tell him I said hi. Okay, I will. <laughs> if you have a thought, and, and we tend to believe ourselves, right? I mean, if 
if, if I put a blindfold on you and walk you around uh, downtown or whatever and and you believe I've walked you to the edge of a 10-story building, and you believe that, we tend to believe ourselves, and that's what you're telling yourself. You're going to fight like trying to put a cat in a sack if I'm getting you to take the next... Guy, he's got the stupidest sayings. My God, bro. Step. You're like, whoa, no, I, I'm not going to do this because I've told myself this is going to be a doozy when I take this step. So if, you, if you're telling yourself that, you tend to believe yourself. Well, we've got to start getting people to verify their thoughts. Um, I, I say that to people that are suicidal all the time. Test the rationality of your thoughts. Is what you're telling yourself, this, do you, are you telling yourself you want to die or are you telling yourself you want to stop the pain? Those are two very different things, and both of them have long-term consequences. So let's really test that out. That's sound psychological analysis right there. Absolutely. Uh, second, does it protect and prolong your life? Does it get you what you want? I mean, there are just some very simple questions that you can ask yourself. And, uh, and all of a sudden, if it fails any of those simple criteria, then you go, okay, I got to replace this with something that fits the criteria. Uh, now... Uh, people aren't just kind of wandering around deciding, well, I, you know, I, I trusted myself, but I didn't really know how to test my thinking. Well, I'm just giving them a very simple way to test their thinking. Number one being, is it verifiable fact, what you're telling yourself? And if it's not, you don't even go to number two. You, you've, you've got to deal with facts and reality. And uh, you know, people that are rejecting science uh, saying biology just doesn't apply. We're going to decide that we're, we're changing all that. The, the, you know. That's not happening. Biology doesn't apply or whatever. Let me tell you something about being trans. I know that's where he's going with this. I know that's the whole point here. In 99.9% .9 of the cases, your biology and your gender identity are linked 99% of the time, you are a man if you, ha if you have, like, male reproductive parts, for example. But 1% of the time, you don't. They're not connected to each other. You have male reproductive parts, and you have a female brain, effectively. Or you have, like... A yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Dr. Phil's certainly aware of that, right? Is he aware of that outlier? I mean, there are exceptions to every rule. The rule is your gender matches your sex, but there are exceptions to that. Does he, like, not realize that? Has he been through a psychology class before, ever, literally ever in his life? How did he get this far along with absolutely no clue about this subject. Everything that he said so far has actually been on point. He's been correct about all of it, basically. He's been right, yes. All that stuff is accurate that he said. Why are you wrong about this? Have you not researched it enough? Do you not care? Do, are you lying? I don't know. I don't understand. Uh, saying biology just doesn't apply. We're going to decide that we're, we're changing all that. You know, there aren't men and women. We're going to change all that. That's wrong. Nobody says that. Nobody says biology does not apply. That's fabricated garbage. That's G-A-R-B-I-T-C-H, garbage. And I don't see how he doesn't see it for what it is. I'm just checking which things here I got to hit. Okay, cool. Let me check uh, Discord. Elgato Video Capture. Oh, is there a system where you can... Hold on. Checking here. Okay. Yeah, I may hit... Oh, oh my God. I didn't mean to do that. Fireable fact. What you're telling yourself. Okay, there we go. Hmm... Is this for a VCR? Is that what that is? And it feeds into your computer? 
Interesting. Okay. Hmm. I didn't know that existed. Hmm. I have to check that out later. Video DVD conversion kit. VHS to DVD. <laughs> Two blank DVDs. That's funny. Okay. We'll check that out. Oops. And if it's not, you don't even go to number two. You, you've, you've got to deal with facts and reality. And uh, you know, people that are rejecting science. Uh, Nobody's rejecting science, Phil. Who? What people specifically? What are you talking about? Is there a group of people out there that's rejecting science? Which ones? What are they rejecting exactly? How many are there? It's completely fabricated nonsense. This isn't happening. Uh, saying biology just doesn't apply. We're going to just no one said that. Decide that we're we're changing all that. You know there aren't men and women. We're going to change all that. Well, I'm I'm sorry. You don't get to just decide that. Yeah, I guess you. No one decided that. Nobody said that. Decide that for yourself, but you're certainly not going to decide it for me. And and if you're pushing that agenda, that's where you can't stay silent. So others remain comfortable. You just can't let them run roughshod over you and everybody else with that agenda. This isn't happening. This is just like, I don't know of a, okay, I am, you know, pretty involved in left-wing circles. And I've literally never in my entire life ever heard of anybody who seemed to believe that, like, biology, that, all right, that, let me rephrase, that, who seemed to think that sex and gender were not linked to each other at all in any way ever if that were if that's obviously not the case who is telling you this who's feeding you this information have you interviewed people have you created control groups and uh, groups of like trans people and uh groups of uh, cis people and gone through like the you know broken it all down and done the studies and all that have you done any of that or are you just completely talking out your ass right now do you have anything to back up what you've said so far or are you just completely full of shit because it sounds like you're full of shit right now i'm looking for any reason to think you're not give me one um just so they don't get upset with you for saying no sorry I'm not going to let you rewrite biology for me and my family, me and my life. I'm not going to let you pretend we didn't have slavery in our history just because you've decided that it's not good for kids to hear about that. Well, well, is somebody doing that? What are you talking about? I've decided it is good for kids to hear about that. I've decided they need to know that there were dark times in our history, and we can only learn from those dark times by acknowledging them. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. You've got to acknowledge this. And and so I, I think I'm trying to get people to start thinking, but if you give them some rules for thinking, they're going to be more efficient about it. Okay, I'm just like, I'm lost. I have no clue what he's going on about right now. And it just makes no sense whatsoever. I'm trying, man. I am really trying. All right, let me just double check this. So, bargainer statue. Oh, I haven't hit this one yet. Okay, got it. We are in the midst of... Okay, now we get another advertisement. Thanks, Annie. Oh, my God. I just hit a button and it jumped away. Here it is. Yeah, okay. Let's jump forward past the stupid ad. Okay, here we go. In that answer, you integrated principle three, four, and six. Three. Like, I don't have a list of the principles. That'd be fantastic if you told me what they were. Was don't reward bad behavior or support conduct you do not value. Do not stay silent just so others can remain comfortable. That's six. And four was measure all actions based on results and thought on rationality. So if I understand you correctly... One yeah, why is he clicking the holy shit out of his pen right now? Why don't you just stop clicking the fucking pen? I'm sorry. Why don't you stop clicking the fucking pen already? Jesus. All actions based on results and thought on rationality. So 
if I understand you correctly, one of the things you're pointing out is that you're called upon to make your opinion known. You're called upon to say something. You're called upon to differentially reward and punish based on the concordance of what you're hearing with what you know to be true. Why doesn't he just use English? What the fuck does concordance mean? This guy is insufferable. Rationally. And so the, the idea there would be that part of your conscience calls you to oppose opinions that are not aligned with the natural order of things, right? I mean, it's tricky, right? Because you hear all the time in the Enlightenment rationalist types, they say, follow the facts. And that's a weak argument because facts themselves don't specify a destination. On the no, that's correct, I suppose. On the other hand, there are opinions that fly in the face of what's real so egregiously that if you attend to them, you're going to walk into a pit. You're going to walk off a cliff. I, what are you talking about exactly? He's saying that if you follow the facts, you're going to walk off of a pit and that facts don't give you any useful information or you can't follow them. What? I mean, this is the kind of garbage I'd expect to hear from a pseudo-Christian, pseudo-New Age nutcase. And so if you, your principle number six, the, the justification you had for that was that you shouldn't stay silent just so others can remain comfortable when you know that what is being said violates a reasonable understanding of, of the natural and social order. It's something like that. And so that indicates a belief in an order that's beyond the mere verbal, right? You know, like the Derrida in particular, I think it was Jacques Derrida in, in On Grammatology, he famously said, there's nothing outside the text. Now, he walked that back to some degree when he was pushed on it, but I think it does get to something that's core in, in the postmodernist ethos, which is the idea that... Why isn't he using English? Why does he keep saying postmodernist ethos and all of that other garbage? Just use English, please. There's nothing to truth but the consensus of words, and that if you can change the consensus of words, you can, cha you can change the truth. But the thing... Uh, I don't know what that means, and it sounds wrong at its face. There's nothing to truth but the consensus of words? What could that possibly mean? What sense could I possibly make of that? It sounds like complete garbage. Thing is, is that the verbal order has to reflect the intrinsic order of the cosmos, or it becomes delusional. Like a delusional verbal representation is internally consistent. Right, and people can even develop a consensus around it, which is what if Right, and that's why you need to include facts. Yes, absolutely. So string theory is a great example of this. It's, it's not delusion at all, but there's no evidence for string theory. It's not a theory. String theory is really string hypothesis. You can come up with all kinds of creative explanations and justifications and everything for why you are very confident that this is true, that this is the case. But it doesn't mean that it is. There can be internal consistency without it being real or true or accurate, without a doubt. That's why you have to include facts in the equation. That's why you have to have falsifiability in any um, uh, hypothesis or, or in any theory. You must have falsifiability. You have to be able to prove it wrong and attempt to prove it wrong, but not be able to. It has to pass the falsifiability test. So uh, that's what's different about a, uh, I, I guess you'd say a hypothesis and an actual full-blown theory. A fad is or a social contagion. And so your hypothesis is something like conscience calls us to speak when the, when the consensus has become delusional.
It's something like that. Does that does that seem reasonable? That is a reasonable interpretation. And you know from your, your clinical experience that uh, how difficult it is to penetrate a well-structured, deeply entrenched delusional system. Uh, I mean, sometimes <laughs> you can you can spend months and months and months uh, trying to penetrate a, a individual's delusional system and think you're making all the way in the world. Um, I had a woman one time that I was working with that was convinced that she was being uh, followed, monitored, and hearing voices from her walls, and I spent all this time. This sounds like schizophrenia. Um, delusions come with schizophrenia paranoid delusions particularly commonly not always sometimes they're grandiosity uh delusions of grandiosity like kanye west has delusions of grandiosity and i'm going to chalk that up to his mix of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia um because delusions of grandiosity are a sign of uh i'm sorry delusions of grandiosity are a sign of bipolar disorder not just like schizophrenia so anyway i'm and and felt like i really had made progress and uh she said yeah i you've convinced me i'm 100 percent you you got me cured doc I'm, I'm i'm great uh and on the way out she said i i did however cut the wires to all the intercom system in the house because that's where i'm hearing the voices so it's like I, I'm with you, but on the other hand, I did strip all the intercom out of the house, and I thought, you know what? I'll take that partial victory, uh, but you get into confirmation bias with people, and folks don't understand. When you're dealing with people with confirmation bias, um, you know, research tells us if you... Confirmation bias being you see something happening and you find a way to fit it into your overarching view of the world basically so everything feeds into it so you see a single mexican walking down the road and that feeds into your bias your existing belief that you know immigrants are everywhere when that's just complete nonsense like it's very possible nay likely that there's just like a dude walking down the street and it's not a big deal and it doesn't feed into anything at all. Like, it's just, there's no overarching principle or no overarching issue taking place here or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, a guy walking down the street. That's confirmation bias. You're dealing with people with confirmation bias. Um, you know, research tells us if you bring them solid evidence to the contrary, they just dig in their heels. That's true. That's why you need to, see, to use Socratic... Reasoning. It's called the backfire effect in psychology circles. The backfire effect happens when you give people evidence to disprove their existing beliefs. Uh, for example, there's a schizophrenic in the room with you, and the schizophrenic says to you, there's a guy in the back wearing a clown mask. You look back to see what he's talking about, and suddenly, that's confirmation bias. You're looking at and acknowledging the figure that he saw. That's why when you're dealing with schizophrenics, you're never supposed to acknowledge or look at the figures that they report seeing in front of them. You're supposed to assume that they're not there, that they're not real. Or for the sake of the schizophrenic person. Now, when you pass your hand through the person that they believe is there, it really freaks them out. They get completely like lost. Like they have no idea how to deal with what they just saw. It. It's it's mental delusion that you're dealing with here, and it's a serious issue. Um, that's why when you're dealing with a schizophrenic person. You need to be very careful what you do, how you act, the things you say, all of it. You can't just go in completely uninformed and completely unknowledgeable about this subject. You bring them solid evidence to the contrary, they just dig in their heels. Right, so if you pass your hand through the person in the clown mask, they just dig in their heels and, ex and insist, no, it is real, it's real. 
it, it gets worse, not better. Even if you show them scientific, objective, verifiable evidence to the contrary, they just dig in their heels more. So you got to deal with that first before you can get that uh, new data to take Yeah, hold. well, do, do, do you suppose that's maybe a reflection of something that you pointed to earlier? I mean, you know, in the story of Exodus, the, the story of Exodus... Wait, why are we bringing up the Bible? What does this have to do with anything? This indicates that when people leave a tyranny, they enter a desert, right? They don't... Um... No, the story of Exodus is just a story. It doesn't indicate anything. When they exit tyranny, they enter a desert? What the hell does that even mean? They don't leave the tyranny and go to the promised land. They leave a tyranny and they go to a desert. And maybe the problem with treating delusions with rational argumentation is that you break down the person's self-imposed interior tyranny, but you present them with the desert. So I, I wonder to what degree, man, maybe this is reflected in the fact, you know, what, one of the most effective long-term cures... I have no idea. He's giving an argument by analogy, and it is completely off the rails right now. It makes no sense at all. I have no clue what he's going on about. ...for addictive behavior, especially alcoholism, appears to be religious transformation. And part of the reason for that, and AA capitalizes on that, but AA also provides people with a community that isn't focused on addictive behavior. Mm, AA is valuable for that and that alone, that it's focused on a community that isn't focused on addictive behavior. But guess what? You can get that all kinds of places. I went to groups, secular groups, that were not affiliated with AA, and none of them were focused on addictive behavior either. Very valuable to have a community like that, absolutely. Now, I personally happen to think that, you know, as it, somebody went to school for substance abuse counseling, psychology degree, I personally believe that America, or, I'm sorry, that um, Alcoholics Anonymous is damaging and bad and should not be attended. We should not be going to AA or NA, Narcotics Anonymous, because... Ultimately, they're trying to cram a religious message down your throat and replacing God or replacing drugs with God at the end of the day. And guess what? Drugs and God fit into the same part of the brain as each other. So now what happens when your faith is challenged? You have nothing left. You've just built your entire personality on this thing because it was previously built upon drugs. What are you going to do when you realize it's all nonsensical? Or what are you going to do if you come to the determination that it's nonsensical, even if it's not? Even if God is real, what are you going to do when you realize that the uh, AA group that you go to had a contradictory, nonsensical interpretation of the Bible? You're going to lose your reason for living. You're going to lose your reason for sobriety. It is important to base sobriety not on God, the way AA does, but on yourself, because you want it, because it's valuable to you. I wonder if the solution to the supplantation of a delusion isn't deconstruction, you know, isn't just poking holes in the delusion, but the simultaneous elaboration of a more comprehensive system of explanation that doesn't have the same flaws as the delusion. I mean, you kind of, you kind of... What he's doing here is advocating for replacing drugs with God. We can't just replace drugs, or we can't just get, erase drugs, get rid of them. We have to replace them with something else. And that something else, in my opinion, just so happens to be God. You intimated that when you said that it was immoral to do nothing but deconstruct, to do nothing but poke holes without providing a solution. So I don't know what you think about that clinically. And that hadn't occurred to me before with regard specifically to working with delusions. Yeah, well, I've I've seen it in the real world, uh, in working with juries, um, 
I think one of the biggest myths is uh, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. Alexa, stop. Just a reminder to go to the DMV, sorry. This is uh, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. That the burden of proof is on the prosecution. Yes, that's accurate. The burden of proof is on the prosecution. What do you mean that's not accurate? That's a myth. Uh, that may be written down in the rule books, <clears throat> but if you're really going to defend someone, you better present the jury with an alternative explanation. Right, 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 uh, right. Just sure, sure, yes. It, it, it's, okay, so it's presented as though you're innocent until proven guilty, but, all right, let me rephrase, let me rephrase this. The prosecution will not present a case or not charge a case unless they have strong reason to believe that there was something going on that was of questionable activity. Let's say um, you rob a convenience store and your fingerprint's there. And the prosecutor brings a case against you because they have your, your fingerprint. And they checked that table the night before and it was wiped. They wiped the table down. Uh, hell, they wiped the table down 20 minutes before the robbery happened and now your fingerprint is on it. Put it that way. Well, you're innocent until proven guilty. But we happen to know for a fact that your fingerprint is on this table. So you're going to have to provide us an alternative explanation for why that is. So no, the court system still works in an uh, innocent until proven guilty way. It's just you, you're going to have to explain these coincidences, quote unquote, that took place that led to the charge in the first place. That's all. Has nothing to do with innocent until proven guilty. It, this just shows me that Phil doesn't understand the first thing about the legal system. Better present the jury with an alternative explanation. Right, 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 uh, right. Just proving a negative is, is very hard to do to begin with. But they want to hear, if we're not down here for the reason we're told we're down here, then you better give me a alternative explanation of how this happened and why we're down here. Um, and until you give them an alternative explanation, you're fighting an uphill battle for sure. And I think that's true with what you're saying about delusions. You need to give them an alternative existence outside that delusional system that's not a... He's giving us another argument from an ana uh, from analogy, and it's nonsensical garbage. It doesn't mean anything at all. It, the argument from analogy that he's giving us here is just garbage. Like, why is he even going down this road? It means nothing. Desert. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think part of the reason... People need a people need a coherent belief system because. What does he mean by that exactly? Otherwise, they're incoherent, right? And so, what happens? I think this is also why power and hedonism have become focuses of identity. Because people don't have cohesive belief systems. Is when the when the higher forms of identity collapse then people default towards narratives of power. That's what and, and what are the higher forms of identity? What do, you, what do you mean by that, Jordan? Higher forms of identity? Like what? The Marxists do, right? Or this meta-Marxism we have now is every single dimension of potential comparison between people devolves into explanation of power, right? Is that all there are is in, there's an infinite number of dimensions of oppression. And it's an interesting explanation because... Dude, I am so lost. What the hell is this guy talking about? When systems deteriorate, they do deteriorate in the direction of power and oppression. So there's almost no system that you can point to that can't be explained in part with a power narrative. And alternatively, you can have a narrative of, of instantaneous gratification, something like that.
I don't know what he means by this or what point he was trying to get to by saying it, but okay, go on. And it's better to replace that with, well, that's what we're struggling with in this conversation, right? Is that we're, you want to replace those narratives of power and, and gratification with a higher order narrative that offers more and explains more simultaneously. You, you at least want to replace it with a social system uh, where you're not in a situation where you've, I, I would, and I'm not the first one to say this, and it's been said, or it's been said better than I can say it, uh, but I would a lot rather have questions I can't answer than answers I can't question. And yes, okay, I agree. And right now we're in a situation too often where we have answers we can't question, because if if you question an answer, you're labeled a hater. You're labeled some kind of phobe. You're labeled yeah. some kind of... Look, look, the problem is that the answers that you've been given, you're more than free to ask those questions and do research and try to understand the answers and honestly ask people who are, you know, ask somebody of the LGBT community, what does this mean? Why do they feel this way or that way? That's not the problem. Honestly, finding answers to these questions isn't the issue. Everyone's fine with answering questions, whatever questions you got. And you know what? At the end of the day, if you're not satisfied with the answers, okay. Okay, that's fine. It's not asking the questions that's the problem. The problem is to say asking why being gay is allowed in society, for example, or how being gay evolved or whatever is, you're not asking the question for an answer. There is an underlying implication with the question. You're implying that it's wrong. Feel free to ask the question, go nuts. Ask to your heart's content. It's a fascinating question. How did being gay evolve? I looked for the answer one time. I was curious. How does evolution jive with uh, homosexuality? The answer? Throughout history, there were... Throughout history, there have been times where the population that we're dealing with has had a surplus of orphans and a shortage of parents, but a surplus of parents who wanted children. Being gay was uh, not filtered out because gay people served an evolutionary purpose. I had another question why are baby cats cuter than baby humans to us? You'd think that baby humans were the cutest thing on planet Earth. I still haven't really found an answer to that, but the point is, these questions are perfectly A-OK -okay to ask. It's OK to ask them. The problem is asking them in an adversarial way in which... The real point of asking the question is to denigrate and hate and tear somebody down. Not looking for an answer, looking for a way to hurt somebody else. Yeah. Of, of, of heretic, just by asking a question, God forbid you disagree, uh, but I, I would... Like, disagreeing is okay, too. Feel free, go nuts, disagree. None of this stuff is a problem. It's that you refuse facts when they're presented to you. And you know what? Okay, if you accept all of the facts and you still disagree, all right. That's fine. I get that. Some people just refuse to accept certain things. That makes you dumb as dog. It doesn't mean you're an asshole necessarily for denigrating the LGBT community. It just means you're too fucking stupid to understand the question in the first place, let alone the answer. That's all.
lot rather have a, a whole set of questions we haven't found the answers for yet than have a whole set of answers I'm not permitted to even challenge questions. You're allowed to challenge these questions. No one said you weren't. Who told you you weren't allowed to challenge these questions, Phil? Which person? Point the person out. Tell me where they touched you, where they hurt you. Question dig in on. And I think that's where we are uh, when we're dealing with cults, when we're you dealing with see. power mongers. So imagine that it's easy to confuse a questioner with a deconstructionist. Like, as if there aren't people out there right now, as we speak, research professors studying, writing professional studies that will be cited in the future, explaining why gay people evolved along with straight people, as if that, you know, that isn't happening. The questions aren't the issue. You're allowed to ask anything you want. So imagine that it's easy to confuse a questioner with a deconstructionist, right? So let's say I'm in a comfortable delusion and you come along and start asking questions. Now, my objection to you could be, you're doing nothing but poking holes. Now you're making the claim, and I think this is actually a pointer to what the higher part of identification should be. Poking holes is okay. There's nothing wrong with poking holes in my opinion. You should be able to poke holes. If something is not, uh, if something can have holes poked in it like that, then it's not structurally sound and should have those holes poked. It, again, I reiterate, string theory is a perfect example. String theory is a hypothesis, not a theory. And holes should be poked in that. We should be poking holes in things if they don't really fully make sense to us. No, is that, so for example, the ancient Egyptians worshiped the open eye, right? That's the eye of Horus. And their notion was that the force that renews everything is the eye that pays attention. And, and it's akin to the idea of questioning, right? The, 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 the the redemptive questioner questions to build. He doesn't question to destroy. But it's easy for people who are entrenched in the delusion to treat every questioner as if he's nothing but an agent of destruction. And, you know... No, I mean, questioners can build or destroy. I don't think it matters. Feel free. If something doesn't stand up to scrutiny, then it doesn't stand. Oh, you, you mentioned something here, which is... Work hard to understand the way others see things. If, if you're a questioner and you're using your questioning to do nothing but destroy the other person's belief system, to elevate your moral stature, right? To show that you're smarter, to show that you have all the answers. That's like the sin of intellectual pride, I would say. It's easy to be viewed as a deconstructive agent. And then you can understand why people get defensive about their beliefs. So. You need to question in the attempt to replace what's insufficient with something better, right? So you have to be a builder and a questioner. And it, it seems to no, me... You don't have to do anything you want. If you want to question something, then that's your absolute right to question it. I don't understand. That that, that conception of who you are that's part and parcel of treating yourself and others with dignity and respect or even be, being who you are on purpose, that means something like the recognition that you're a building questioner, right? Not a destroying questioner and putting that at the center. I think, it requ I think that requires you to do something that most people I don't think come to naturally and that is we have to determine what other people's currency is because we assume that people have the same currency as ourselves like i'm so goddamn fucking confused by what they're saying right now what the hell are you guys going on about and that not only is not true it's often not the case for example i think um and you know i work a lot with law enforcement and uh, oh, don't tell me that.
Um, I've, I've, I've done training with law enforcement. On, oh, don't tell me that. On uh, interrogation techniques. Uh, how, oh, no, please, no. How to um, do deception detection, things of that nature. And I always love talking to the negotiators um, about how to get where you want to get in a negotiation. And um, you know, Chris Voss, who's uh, probably the most uh, experienced negotiator with the FBI, um, who's now retired, uh, will, will tell you this very thing. He will tell you that your best shot of ever getting hostages out uh, from uh, a hostage is to befriend the person and to show them that you're looking out for their best interests and you try to, in a good faith way, give them what they want and, and tell them that it was a struggle for them, right? Taker is if you can get that hostage taker to fully and completely believe that you understand why they took that hostage to begin with. Yes, absolutely. With. Whether right, it's right. A, whether it's yeah a, again psych one oh not not psycho one oh this wasn't my first year in psychology uh, classes this wasn't till later domestic violence situation or a political situation or whatever if they understand that you get why they did what they did to begin with so they feel heard that a big part of their currency is, I wanna be heard, I wanna be understood here. I want people to understand and get why I felt driven to this desperate act. Yeah, this is Psychology 101, and this is also part of street epistemology. If you guys ever heard of street epistemology, the idea is to communicate to people that you understand why they're doing what they're doing and you're on board even with some of it you know you talking to a trump supporter totally agree with a lot of stuff i agree there are problems in society i am absolutely 100 percent with you on all of this stuff now how do we fix it what's the best way to fix it don't present facts facts are irrelevant and it's going to cause the backfire effect you want to give people a voice. You want them to be heard and understood. And if you, if you meet them halfway, if you understand and hear them, they will understand and hear you. It's reciprocal. People want a reciprocal connection with somebody else. That's what they're looking for. Yeah, that, absolutely. I didn't actually, uh, yeah, it took me forever to get to this point. I think that I learned this outside of psych classes, as a matter of fact. Um, that if you can convince them that, hey, I get it. I, I, I'm not saying I agree with you, but I see through your eyes how the world looked and why you did what you did. Not saying I agree with it, not saying... It don't even, no, don't even say not saying I agree with it. Just say, I get it. I understand. It makes sense. Totally. I get why you did what you did. Let's leave it at that. Say, you know, these are innocent people, right? I'm hoping that, like, I just want to get these innocent people out, man. And whatever it takes, you know, you want to get out of here? I get that. You want to get out of here? Continue the fight? Totally. Make sure you're on their side. That's what it's all about. And you're going to get away with it. I'm just telling you I understand how this looked from your point of view. And I mean, that's true all the way down to a teenager wanting to have a later curfew. You know, they, they can assume, well, you know, my mom and dad just want to control me. And they're saying he's just wanting to be more independent. And if you really listen, you can find out, wait a minute, they're being motivated by the currency of safety they know that most of the accidents happen between when the bars let out and the next two hours. They want me off the street for safety purposes. And if they understand he wants to be with his friends when all the fun's happening right at the end of the evening, and 
they could negotiate where they both get what they want if they can just agree you're going to be at somebody's house verifiably hanging out during that time. Uh, yeah, negotiation is where everybody loses. Uh, then we can negotiate something in between. You're off the street, but I don't have to be home with mommy and daddy. So if, if they understand they each have a different currency, giving becomes much easier. And But to do that, you've got to really listen and learn from somebody to know what's important to them. Right. Yeah, what Phil is saying here is um, accurate psychological, uh, accurate to the psychological research. This is correct, what he's saying. Jordan Peterson is not accurate to psychological research. He's not accurate to the English language, honestly. Right. Well, you're, well, and you're pointing to something there that's a source of inestimable reward in relation. Uh, a source of what reward? Did you just offend my mother? What is that a word? What was it? He, what was it he said? Let me step back. Listen again. To something there that's a source of inestimable reward. Inestimable with a C. That's not a word. He's just like making words up. Inestimable is a word. You can't estimate something. Inestimable is not a word. What the hell are you saying, Jordan? Word in relationship to listening, because, you know, a skeptic might say, well, for example, why should I listen to you if I can just force you to do what I want? Um, I, okay, I'm a skeptic and I wouldn't say that. Why do you think I would say that? And there's a couple of answers to that. I mean, the first answer is, well, you might be able to force the person now, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to force them tomorrow. And it certainly doesn't mean you're going to be able to force them once they come along with all your friend, their friends and tell you... Yes, win hearts and minds. ...to go to hell. And so solutions imposed by force tend to be unstable. Yes. So that's very much worth knowing. And, you know, I've looked... So, you know, I, I, interviewed, I interviewed Chris Voss, by the way, but I also interviewed Franz de Wall about chimpanzees, and he's one of the world's foremost primatologists, and he's pointed out quite clearly that chimp alphas who use force have very short-term and violent reigns. Okay, I, I don't know the, what research he's talking about, but to my knowledge, this whole idea of alpha, the alpha male, the alpha dog, the alpha whatever, is fake. It, the study was originally done on wolves, and somebody was convinced that there was an alpha wolf that ran the pack, wrote a whole book about it. Turns out what he was observing was actually just a parent taking care of the children, not an alpha, not like a controlling wolf or whatever. And he pulled his book from the shelves and tried to retract it and say, no, 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 this is wrong, guys, please, no. But it was too late. It took root. Everybody started talking about all this alpha shit. I don't know what this alpha chimp thing is about. Is there an alpha chimp? Maybe, but I'm super skeptical. And they reign over very fractured and destabilized chimp troops. So you can use force for a while, but it'll, it'll come back to haunt you. So then you might say, well, what's the alternative? And you laid that out to some degree with work hard to understand the way others see things. If, if I can understand what it is that you value, and then I can negotiate with you a solution that enables you to move forward to what you value, while, we, while I move forward simultaneously toward what I value, then we've instantly created a relationship that will survive without supervision, right? That's one of the things that's so cool about that is that... Um, do relationships need supervision? You know what? I shred these two guys, Dr. Phil and uh, Jordan Peterson. I, I shred them. But I have to say, it's better than Andrew Tate, right? They don't seem to be like complete ass backwards narcissists 
who don't seem to care about anything or anybody but themselves. So I'll take it as a W. I just like... I think they are narcissists, but they don't show it. They say it in more veiled ways. Well, at the very least, uh, Peterson does. Peterson says it in a veiled way. He views situations in a more veiled way and he acts more of a he acts as more of a supporter for extremism and nutter buttery than an extremist himself like he does everything he can to maintain systemic racism as a power structure but he doesn't seem to be like outwardly, openly racist himself, the way that Andrew Tate is, for example. If you, if you pay attention to someone and you understand what motivates them, and then that's built into your agreement, you don't have to be a tyrant and you don't have to micromanage because you and the person will walk side by side without mutual supervision. Right, so Jean Piaget figured this out, by the way, when he was studying children. You know, he figured this out technically. He said, if you put, imagine you put two systems in head-to-head -head competition with one another. One system was uh, like an aristocratic tyranny, top-down, using force. And another system was bottom-up, using voluntary agreement. The system based on voluntary agreement will always outcompete the system based on force because the system based on force will waste energy in um, enforcement. Yeah, sure. Well, and he was exactly right. And, you know, Piaget also showed that actual learning that would be incorporated and saved was much better from the bottom up than from the top down because people felt a degree of cooperation and Piaget was right about that. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, that's partly why too, even in psychotherapy, you know, par part of the reason you don't give people advice as a psychotherapist is because if you haven't walked through the process of coming to the conclusion, the conclusion itself is rather weak. So if I deliver my client a ready, you know, now and then, you know this, is now and then you've got someone in your therapeutic practice and they're in a fix and you know how you they could get out of it. You could just tell them. But if you tell them, first of all, they don't get to solve the problem. And you can take credit for that. You steal that from them. And second, they actually haven't gone through the effort necessary to generate the knowledge structure that will enable them to solve similar problems in the future. It's like... You can, you can control everything your child does and nothing bad will happen to them, but as soon as you, your child has, doesn't have you around, they're completely bereft. You know, maybe that was your goal all along if you're like... Yeah, okay, I appreciate that. What's all this, your goal all along, having a bereft kid? What? Like a devouring mother, for example. But, but I wonder how much of that... Is that associated... That associ are those ideas associated with your... Principles seven and eight said actively live and support meritocracy and identify and build consequential knowledge. Is there a bridge to that, 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 what would you say, that willingness to take it upon yourself to solve problems and, and, to, and to deal with your own affairs? Well, you're, you're certainly right about the meritocracy. I, I, I believe this. Um, we, we've made some really bad decisions, and, and I saw it happen. Um, Who's we? With, you know, COVID, where uh, uh, the United States government spent $5.5 trillion in... You mean Donald Trump. Donald Trump spent $5.5 .5 trillion, go on. ...giveaways during COVID... They weren't giveaways. They were incentives to keep people from going outside and spreading it to other people. It wasn't like a mandate. You're not, it's not like you're not allowed to set foot outside. That wasn't the case. It was an incentive that to just be on unemployment for a little while if the company doesn't need you, if you're not like an essential worker to the company or whatever, until things start to calm down a little bit. That's what that was for. 
and you're really complaining about the measly i think i got uh i got a covid stimulus what was my covid stimulus i think it was like a thousand dollars or something for a total of like six months of not being in work or not working i mean i was working from home but most people weren't working for like six months minimum right so a thousand dollars wow yes thank you so much i appreciate that and 4.4 trillion of it went into checking or savings which means it wasn't urgently needed that it's complete not uh, how much 0.4 trillion of it went giveaways during covid and 4.4 trillion of it went into checking or savings which wow 4.4 trillion of it went into are you trying to tell me that only 600 oh wait let me do the numbers on this hold on what is it wait a minute let me just Hang on, I'm trying to figure this out. Five trillion six hundred billion. So six hundred billion divided by was it five trillion? Hundred thousand million billion. Okay. So you try I think this is the right number so you're trying to tell me 0 0.012 percent is that right or is it I, i'm not sure it, it might be 1.2 percent let's just assume it's 1.2 are you trying to tell me 1.2 percent of the money 1.2 percent went directly into checking or savings i don't know how you would even know that but let's just assume that's true what you're really saying is 98.2 of those dollars, 98.2% 98 of that money had velocity. It went into something required. It paid rent or it paid the electric bill or, or it whatever. Seems like money well spent to me. Are you kidding? Is he complaining about this? Good. And 4.4 trillion of it went into checking or savings, which means it wasn't urgently needed. No, I'm sorry. 4.4 trillion out of 5 trillion went into checking or savings. No, that's just complete fabrication. 4.4 trillion of $5 trillion went into checking or savings is what you're telling me. Come on. Does anybody really believe that? Anybody? Uh, people just tucked it away and said, yeah, thanks. We'll take that and tuck it away. Um, and then they, uh, they, they pay people more not to work than to work. Nonsense. It's just complete nonsense. All of this. Like he said earlier, we have to work off of a common set of facts, right? You're not giving factual information right now. You and I are not working off of the same facts, Find factual information and come back to me. And I mean that literally. Uh, when you take all of the bonuses and the credits and... It's just complete bullshit. Uh, extending unemployment plus the $600 a week bonus on top of unemployment. And the person is able to stay home and not pay what in L.A. was $7 a gallon for gas at one point, so they don't have to do the commute and have that expense, and they don't have any wardrobe expense and all, and they can just... Trust me, people suffered during COVID. Believe me. COVID was not a pleasant time for anybody. And if you think it was, then you live in a fantasy land. Nobody enjoyed COVID. It was ugly and horrific and painful, and people lost family. They lost everything and everybody. So I don't, I don't want to hear any of this bullshit about how COVID was so great. Everybody loved COVID. You know, COVID is fantastic. Why don't we all go back to COVID? No, nobody wants that. It wasn't fun. Sit on... Uh... And you know, it's an indication... Of who this guy really is, Phil McGraw. Who is this guy? 
He is somebody with so much money that he'll never be able to spend it in a lifetime. He's somebody with so much money that he doesn't need to work another day in his life if he doesn't want to. The only reason he's working right now, if you can even call it that, is because he enjoys it. He likes it. He wants to spread his ridiculous ideas to everybody and their brother. Uh, the couch and, and not work, and then all that's over, and they can't understand why the supply chain is, is paralyzed. No, we knew why the supply chain was paralyzed. It was because of a hang-up in the Suez Canal. Well, you know, let's think that through, guys. You pay people not to work, and so you get people not working. Uh, hell, Lassie could figure this one out. Uh, it, you got what you paid for. And, and I, I, we had so many lifelong businesses wiped out by the mismanagement of COVID that it's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, these people... Like, this is just complete nonsense, all of it. It's garbage, what he's saying right now. What, how did he get to where he is from where he was? I don't understand. How did we arrive at this position? I'm just like, I'm so lost, it's not even funny. People that spent generations building these family businesses that worked so hard and the margin was narrow and a high percentage of those businesses never recovered. They never came back. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you see what happened in... Uh, well, a lot of those businesses did come back, actually. Joe Biden has created a ton of jobs under his administration. So, yeah, I don't want to hear it. And one of my problems is we do have a generation that is experiencing a mental, emotional crisis. Oh, here we go about the generations. Ready? With the highest levels of anxiety, depression, and, and loneliness uh, since records have been kept. And, and the agencies that keep those records, the CDC and the Department of Education and, and others are the very ones that shut the schools down. They shut. I mean, it was the wisest decision to shut the schools down for a short period of time. Yes. At the school and, and to do it online or uh, remotely. You know, my kid in West Virginia, my kid's school shut down for a short time. And I remember them telling us to drive up, have the parents drive up every day, grab a packet that the kid is supposed to work on every day and read the packet and finish it and turn it in at the end of the week, all of the packets. That's how we started out in the pandemic, trying to solve the problem. Kids were still learning, wasn't ideal, but it was literally saving lives. <clears throat> in retrospect, maybe we should have ended the packet thing a little sooner and gotten in, in, like, in school, like in-person schooling sooner than we did. But we didn't know. We were all waiting through this together. We we're all figuring it out together, okay? Next pandemic that we have in 100 years or whatever it is, we'll know. Are the very ones that shut the schools down. They shut the schools down. And as I said early in our conversation, yeah. I, I was fine with that for a couple of weeks, but then it turns into months and then it turns into a year. And in some cases it turned into two years with remote learning at, that they knew where who who had one year long school shutdowns which person which district what school was shut down for one year can you name them did not work particularly uh with low socioeconomic uh and inner city populations uh who didn't have good wi-fi connections didn't have parents there to help them along the way and when they shut the schools down for that long, they did that knowing these kids were in a mental and emotional crisis, and they knew that those schools were a lifeline to those kids, that they needed that for emotional development. They needed it for educational achievement. They needed it so they had social development, and they shut it down anyway. 
They also knew that the mandated reporters, the teachers, the counselors, the cafeteria workers and bus drivers and coaches were at the schools. And those were... Oh, my God, dude. This is just fear-mongering bullshit. ...were the ones who had their eyes on these children and could report if they saw signs that the child was being molested or the child was being abused in the home. They shut all of... The Look, this is a short-term, like, uh, six-month process that is designed to save tens of millions of people. And guess what? It did. It saved tens of millions of people. And then school kids went back to school. This isn't like a permanent thing. Like, we're erasing public school forever. That's not what happened. This guy lives in, like, a delusion where the government is trying to, like, control everything and force everybody to never go to school again or something. Get over yourselves. My God. Let me guess. You've seen the Died Suddenly or Plandemic movies too, right? That down. And when they did, those referrals dropped 40 to 50% in, in some major markets. And these kids were... In some major markets? In what major markets? Who said that? Where'd you get that information? Don't tell me in some major market. What the hell is a market? Talking about a city? Where did these numbers drop specifically and by how much? This guy is so full of shit, it's ridiculous. We're sent home behind closed doors, locked up with the very abusers. It's not that the abuse went down 40 or 50%. It probably went up because of the frustration of being locked up at home behind those doors. And... They shut the schools down without any plan for bringing them back. That is incorrect, good sir. And you, and so you ask questions about it, and they say, well, we did the best we could with what we knew at the time. No, you... That's true. And yes, they did. They did their best with what they knew at the time. Absolutely. Did not do the best you could with what you knew at the time. You had information that these children were not as susceptible to this disease as everyone else was. You knew they were in a... Yeah, but you knew that their grandma was way more susceptible to the disease, and they were going to their grandma's house every, after school every day. That's a completely different situation, it, one that he's completely ignoring, too. He's pretending it's not a factor in the equation because he wants to be a right winger, seemingly. He wants to ignore it. I don't understand how, what, like, how it could be any other way. What other explanation is there when I'm listening to him say this kind of shit? The mental health crisis, you knew this was their lifeline and you yanked it out from under them. As if these kids gave it, or I'm sorry, as if these people gave a shit about kids. Suddenly, they care about kids when it's politically advantageous to them. Otherwise, they'll give them the absolute bare minimum that is legally required for lunch. Like the bare minimum um, like nutritional value that is legally required. They'll give them Lunchables for lunch. Like this is insane. These people don't care about kids. They care about propagandizing. And you damn well knew what you were doing when you did it. So lur lurking behind that, the your principles seven and eight, I've got about three more questions I hope we can address. And so we'll start with this one, I think. I've been thinking a lot about what might constitute a meritocracy from a technical perspective. You know, and so, well, the first thing we might point out is that hopefully we could all agree that there are some things that are worth doing in comparison to other things. And if we can't agree on that, we can't ever get anything done. So some things are worth doing in comparison to others. Doing the things that should be done efficiently and effectively means that we can do more of them or we can do the good thing faster. And so that seems to be good. And then a meritocracy is, it's essentially reward for those things. It's reward for those things and punishment for failure to do it, right? So once you decide that something is to be done, you valued it, then you value those actions and patterns of attention that will lead to that outcome, and that's a meritocracy. Uh, I feel like I just waded through molasses to understand what the fuck he's talking about, but sure, okay, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm too... <laughs> stupid to understand what he's trying to communicate but okay go on 
right? And so then you could add a, another level of definition there that ties in with what we've been describing is that if the proper you, if the proper self is something like long-term harmony established voluntarily with others, then a proper meritocracy is a system that rewards behaviors that are aimed at that and punishes those that aren't, right? And that's also what you would be called upon to speak about, for example, when you're not staying silent just so others can remain comfortable. So there's a when you're not remaining silent just so others can stay comfortable. Okay. I don't know of a single person who does that, but whatever. The technical issue with regards to meritocracy here. Now, like, here's the thing. The only time that that applies or makes any sense whatsoever, staying silent so others can remain comfortable, is when basically you're not calling people the N-word. That's pretty much the extent of it. You're remaining silent so others can be comfortable. Well, they're not comfortable hearing the N-word, so I have to stay silent? Yes. Now, I want to, so you, you can tell me what you think about that, but then I want to tie that into something you mentioned much earlier too, which is the tyranny of the fringe, right? So I think there's always a fringe, right? And I, I think the fringe generally tends to be people who are pursuing power and people who are pursuing short-term hedonistic self-gratification. He keeps saying hedonistic self-gratification. I don't know what he means by that. Does he mean atheist? People who just do whatever because they like doing it? I mean, I am a non-believer and that's not how I act. So I'm not sure like what stereotype he has built up in his head about people like this. And the fringe is much noisier and much louder and much more dominant than it's been, certainly, that, that I can ever remember. Yeah, tell me about it. And I'm wondering, Dr. Phil, do you think maybe it's, I've been wrestling with this idea, you know, we're all connected together now, and there's no reason to assume that what's pathological can't spread with equal rapidity compared to what's valuable. Right, so now we're all hooked together. We can say, well, good ideas spread faster, but we can say, well, yeah, bad ideas, bad contagious ideas also spread faster. Now, part of what stops bad contagious ideas from spreading in, re in real life is that there's, you can identify the people who are spreading them and you can stop them. It's because you see them face to face and maybe you, in principle, continually interact with them. Right? So they can be held responsible. So here's, here's a hypothesis. It's a deep hypothesis. You tell me what you think about it. Okay, well, when he says hypothesis, he, by definition, means I have no evidence to back this up. But okay, what's your hypothesis? Virtualization enables psychopathy. And the reason it does is because it decouples action from consequences. So he's saying... People being online enables people to be psychopaths because it decouples what? And the reason it does is because it decouples action from consequences. Okay, I suppose so. Think of, think 4chan and anybody on the like the 4chan side, you know, far right nutcases who are like literally like celebrating Hitler's birthday every year and stuff and reading Mein Kampf and all that junk. Um, yeah. Okay, I can see that for them, I suppose. He, of course, he's talking about trans people. I mean, it's almost like a definition of virtualization, right? I mean, if I'm an anonymous, sadistic troll, mm -hmm. I can say whatever the hell I want to any- Again, I say, I don't know what part we're in now, but I'm gonna say it again. I don't ever want to be this close to Jordan Peterson's face for the rest of my life. And I will do anything to prevent that from happening. Sadistic troll. I can say whatever the hell I want to anyone whenever I want. And not only do I not have consequences, I may get attention for it, right? So the incentive structure. So imagine this, and I'm asking you your opinion as a psychologist. So two questions. Do you think virtualization might enable psychopathy? 
And if it so, do you think that using a, a cell phone might make you a psychopath? Does then, what do you think of the danger that poses? Well, no, I don't think it does at all. I don't think using a cell phone creates psychopaths. I think that um, using the internet. Uh, let me rephrase. I think that the internet, um, in it kind of enables psychopaths to gather together. Like, oh, sorry, I dropped something. <clears throat> like, do you guys have any idea how much internet I use? I, this is, this chair that I sit in here, this is a 24-7 thing. I, d I think I've sat on my couch back there a total of three times in my entire life. I sit in this chair 24-7 and I do something. I play StarCraft 2 when I want to relax, or I play Breath of the Wild 2, or I, you know, I play Pokemon, I listen to Nutter Butters, I listen to podcasts and all this, you know, audiobooks and everything, or I write do a lot of writing, script writing, or um, or book writing, or whatever. You know, I'm an author now, I guess. So anyway, that's what I do when I'm here. 24-7, I am always at a screen. Hasn't turned me into a psychopath. At all, like in any way. I'm not a psychopath. I'll answer both of those. Oh, shit. Sorry, one mm -hmm. second. I got to fix my audio. <clears throat> okay, yeah, there we go. Try that again. So Phil's going to tell us if psychopaths are created by screens. They're not. What do you think of the danger that poses? Well, I'm sorry, guys. Oh, yes. By the way, I, I haven't been hitting Super Chats. That's my mistake. I, I, let me try again. Norma Jean McDaniel, welcome. Thank you for coming. And Nerical, welcome. Mary D, thank you for the membership. Brooke Moffat got my shipment notification for the book. So excited. Yes. Uh, Nerical, you got yours too. Book's on the way. Woo. Also, one thing that stuck in my mind is Turmoil in the Toy Box by Pastor Phil Phillips. Who, boy, did that have some bizarre views. Fun for the, for the feline overlords. I got to write that down. Let me copy it and paste it. Um, yeah, you know what? I'll just take the opportunity to show you guys what I'm working with here. Hang on. Since I'm taking a, a slight break here, check this shit out. Oop. There we go. Okay. Take a look at this. Hang on. This ugh, this gigantic 57-pound book is my Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses book. Let me see if I can rearrange the screen here. Hang on. Edit. Yeah, that's the best you're going to get. Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses, I have seven more over there. This one is, wait, this one is the 100 questions. There you go. And it, it's longer than I thought. It's not a booklet. I was shooting for a booklet, but yeah, it's pretty big. It is about 80 pages. And then there's this box. Which is full of bubble mailers. 
Just, I think I have 250 of them in here. Which is not enough. I need more. This is what I'm doing after stream today. Finishing this up. Hey, let me go get something and I'll show you. Okay, I have a laundry cart that I've been using. And here's my laundry cart. It's full of stuff, full of books, just full of these. It's about 200 pounds. Lots of stuff here, so. And I have, um, I have six, uh, six boxes, basically. Well, five boxes, we'll say. Five boxes left. I think I had 350 pre-orders. I'm down to 250 now that I have to ship. So after the stream, I'm taking these to the post office. And then I'm going to fill this puppy back up. Day after that, tomorrow, I mean, bringing it right back down and unloading into their thing. So yeah, that's what I'm up to today. OwenMorgan.com slash book if you're interested. Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses. People tell me it's unstructured. It's interesting, but very unstructured. Um, there's no real good way to fix that in my opinion. Even like before printing, there was no good way to fix it, unfortunately. Uh, so I hope you guys can deal with the fact that it's unstructured. But the 100 questions, at the very least, is very interesting and valuable to extra Jehovah's Witnesses, in my opinion. So, yeah. There's the book. Now you know. And as my friend G.I. Joe says, knowing is half the battle. Norma Jean... My butt's here. Where are you, Owen? Digging the live. Thank you so much. Uh, like vid for our host with the most. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Norm. I appreciate it. Frostwind, his book is called Pokemon and Harry Potter, a Fatal Attraction. Okay, I might get that book. We'll see. There are still people today who think Pokemon is evil because of Stephen Dolins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. I'd prefer we start calling him Mr. McGraw. That'd be good. Mr. McGraw. I like that. I'm going to try that. I read Mein Kampf, and I believe everyone college age and over should read it. It's a, re it's, it's a horrible book, but it helps you recognize a fascist, and it's not going to convince anyone of anything they don't already believe. Yeah, that's true. I thought about getting Mein Kampf and reading it. It would be totally valid for me to get and read, 100%. But I have I was told that it, it's basically just scribblings of a madman. Like, the guy had pretty much, by the time he wrote the book, he'd lost touch with reality. And it was just, it, like, effectively just garbage. And so I haven't really bothered getting a copy. I'm not opposed to it. I just haven't really, you know, it, it doesn't really appeal to me that much. So, And Hitler's speeches, I think, would also be a valuable book to read. But you know what? I have reason to, to study this stuff. Like, that's what I do all, all day, every day. I study extremism. I want to understand it. I want to stop it. Why did Donald Trump have a copy of Hitler's speeches next to his bedside table? One must wonder. 
Uh, Cynthia Norwood, thank you for the uh, super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, a tedi it's tedious to read. I'm about halfway through. Oh, you think? Uh, that's, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Well, I did my best. Um, let's see here. First book. You got to give me props for having it, you know, for, for it being my first book. So there's that. Uh, let's see. I was just looking through here. Jump in the box. You know you want to. Oh, the cat did try to jump in the box yesterday. I stopped her. Oh, I was talking about Mein Kampf. Okay, okay. That's, that makes me feel better. Glad that my book wasn't a tedious read. Yeah, I heard that it was just, like, writings of a madman that didn't make any sense outside of, like, the context of 1940s Germany. And it was, like, confusing. <laughs> Very few people have read my book up to this point. Only people who requested the PDF who did a pre-order. Pretty much, that's it. And some editors. And some people just didn't want a copy of the PDF. They said they'd wait for the physical copy. Well, here it is. I noticed that it took me three hours to burn through 100 uh, copies, give or take. There are 100 orders, I mean. I was signing those copies and you know the whole nine yards all of it and then printing the label and then throwing it in the thing and getting ready to ship and all that so um i think it's probably going to take me a total of about three days to probably maybe four days to like ship all of these because i had like 400 orders or something a total of maybe 500 pre-orders pre-ordered books total somewhere in that vicinity so yeah anyway it's going to take a little bit of time to get them pushed out but i have 65 orders that are either behind or due today slash tomorrow so those are the priority right now and i may actually end up ordering more books we'll see after i finish this i mean i i still have five books to go so you know, little ways to go before I'm done. Anyway, all right, let's continue. Hold on, let me just jump to Twitch so I can see the chats. In what way are JWs not peacefully coexisting in, a, in modern society? That's, that's a good question. Um, well, they are peacefully coexisting in the sense that they're not causing problems for society in general. But for people within their religion, they are causing big problems. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are, at the very least, well known for their protection of child sexual abuse victims instead of just reporting it to the police they have put a concerted effort into hiding the fact that this stuff happened to people within their religion because they don't want to be embarrassed that is not in my mind peacefully coexisting with society this stuff should be reported to the police also, shunning members, removing them from their friends' and family's lives. You get, I guess, like, this is happening to the members, not society, broader society, but it's still unacceptable. So, there's your answer, if you were wondering. Anyway, I'm looking for 
as many little poses as I can get my hands on. I guess I'll go back to this guy, see what he's got. I, I want to hit... I want to get as many pieces of armor as humanly possible and upgrade them a bunch, too. Did Jesus fulfill and break the Ten Commandments, giving us two new ones? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what he did. All right, 300. Wow, that sucks. I really want the Hood of the Depths, or just the Depths outfit. I need 500 for that. And the Tunic of Memories. Let's see, 5, 6, 7, 8, 900... 1,200, yeah, I need 1,200, I need 1,200, uh, all right, so I need 900 from here, 900 pose, that's what I'm shooting for, 900 pose, all right, let's go somewhere out in the middle of nowhere and look for pose, anyway, all right, let's get back to it. Oop, sorry, I forgot to put my headphones back in. Here we go. Why can't I hear it? Oh, it's because I, yeah. What do you think of the danger that poses? Well, I'll answer both of those questions, and I, I answer them uh, pretty much in the affirmative. I don't think that situations create heroes, for example, and I don't think situations create psychopaths. I think it reveals who they are. That's interesting. So uh, the question was, if you were, like, if I don't know what part I'm in now, but if you weren't watching before, the question is, does the fact that we have the internet and the fact that we use screens all the time, does that um, has that led to people being psychopaths? We have real psychopaths on the internet now. Do they have psychopathy because they use the internet all the time? And Dr. Phil gave basically the exact same answer that I gave. Situations create psychopaths. I think it reveals who they are. Situations don't create psychopaths. They, re they reveal who they are. Absolutely agree. Hard agree on this one. I appreciate Dr. Phil saying that. Yes. And, <clears throat> and so you get someone that becomes a keyboard bully. You get somebody that goes uh, just completely out of control I would suggest that they probably were just lying in the weeds waiting for the opportunity uh, to be who... To exploit. Yeah, to just exploit, attack, and be who they were without the consequences. And yep, you know, that, that's why you see people in road rage yelling and screaming with veins popping out of their neck at somebody in a car that can't hear them they would never say that to somebody in an elevator. Right, right, right. Uh, but, but they've got yeah, the that's anonymity. That's also that anonymity. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. and they, it's the same thing with the keyboard bullies. Uh, they, they've got the anonymity, and it may be somebody in their grandmother's basement, or it could be um, you know, somebody that you work with, and they have a different identity, and they would never say that to you across your desk. Uh, and I, I think that's a real problem. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do think it enables them to be who they they probably were to begin with. And and, and that's, that's one of the consequences. That's one of the unintended consequences of the technology. And, you know, I, I hear, um, you know, people talking about, uh, you know, some of the things with um, um, the uptick in uh, activity and uh, the, the transgender movement, and they say, well, we don't think there's... Oh, my God. There's a contagion effect here. Well, really? Yes, really. There's no contagion effect here. Uh, you know, you, you've got 10, yeah, well, uh, 8, yeah, 9, 10 just... times the activity. Uh, and 
Okay, when you're dealing with a total of like five people and out of uh, 330 million, for example, just, you know, picking random numbers, they're not accurate. Five people out of 330 million and you get eight, ten times the number of people that are involved, then you've got 50, 100, 150 out of 350 million. That doesn't have any like bearing on contagion they're thinking per capita rather than um uh, literal numbers they're not thinking about how small the lgbt community was to begin with oh and by the way aids wiped out a lot of the lgbt community back in the 80s and the 90s and they're just now rebuilding in addition to all of that all of that let me show you a little graph i like Oh my God, leave me alone. I don't want your stupid fucking. All right, just serenity now. I have a sign in for the Washington Post. Let me just get in here. Okay, I'm logged into the Washington Post. No more ads, presumably. Here we are. All right, yeah, here, left-handedness. The history of left of left-handedness, rate of left-handedness among Americans by year of birth. 1880 it was about uh, 5%. 1900 fell to 3%. 1960 it topped out at 12% give or take and then it peaked. It 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 just stayed steady. 12% from 1960 onward roughly. That's because left-handedness used to be demonized. Pe you know, people with people who are left-handed used to be considered evil. Left means sinister. It means evil. It means bad. Left-handedness was considered the root of all evil. You don't want to be left-handed. So, anyway, as I was saying, yeah, it's not surprising to find that you know, trans people are now appearing in society, coming out of the closet, if you will, in much larger numbers than they were 10 years ago. Because, A, it was absolutely unacceptable to be trans 10 years ago. B, the LGBT community was decimated by what happened in the 1980s with AIDS. Thanks, Ronald Reagan. He did that shit on purpose, by the way. I don't know if you knew that or not. Completely ignored the HIV pandemic because he thought that it was only affecting gays and drug addicts. So why bother? So we have no, or we have very few older LGBT members, older trans members in their 60s, for example. Way fewer than we will in 60 years, for example. So, uh, yeah. There is no trend of transness or LGBT whatever. It's just fabricated, fear-mongering bullshit, as usual, from these people. Uh, the, the transgender movement, and they say, well, we don't think there's a contagion effect here. Well, really? Uh, you know, you, you've got 10... Yeah, well, eight, yeah, nine, ten just... times the activity, uh, and with girls, uh, that yeah, right, we, we didn't have before. <laughs> I mean, it was typically boys, not girls. Now, girls out knock me over with a feather, really. Eight, ten times the amount of activity than we had before, huh? Weird. So left-handedness went from 3% to 12%. That's four times the activity. I don't believe it's eight, ten times the activity anyway, but, you know, you got to distrust every word out of these people's mouths. But even so, left-handedness was four times the, uh, yeah, four. Four times the percent of people 
that were tra- or that were left-handed from 1900 to 1960. These people are just complete jokes. They're jokes. They're psychologists. They have PhDs in this field. They should know better. Dr. Phil has a PhD in medical and clinical psychology. Jordan Peterson is a research professor in this field. And I debunked it with one graphic. And what are we getting from them? Weasel words. We're getting nothing. They haven't cited a single source in this. You know how many sources I cited in my book? 107. I cited 107 sources in my book. How many do we have in this uh, two-hour-long documentary thing, or two-hour-long video that they produced? Zero. Zero sources. Check this out. Shit, I'm sorry. Hang on. So, um... I just got through recording the audiobook for my book, and I've, I've still got to format it for Audible and everything, make a deal with Audible and all that junk. But I recorded the 100 questions for Jehovah's Witnesses book. I recorded that separately from my Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses book, even though it's like the last chapter in the book, right? I, they're separate recordings. And they're going to be uploaded separately. <clears throat> this book, 80 pages long, an hour and 55 minutes is how long it took for me to record total. I mean, that's how long the book is, an hour and 55 minutes. This one's about 12 hours. This one's an hour and 55 minutes. How many sources do I have in this book? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Yep, 25 sources in this book. Huh, 25 sources in a two-hour book. Wow. And how many sources do they have in their two-hour-long thing here? Zero. These people are full of shit. They're clinical... Psychologists, they are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? They are certified legal psychologists who have worked in the field. Zero citations on any of this. None. Outstrip the boys like, what, 1,100%? And I, I'm, I, I'm saying that by recall, so I'm not offering that as fact. Um, but certainly by a big number, and they say, but we don't think it's a contagion effect. Well, I can uh, I can respect that he said I'm not saying that by fact. I just think that's what it is. I, I can appreciate that. I said that. I say that a lot in my streams, but so much of the stuff that Phil has said in this, or Mr. McGraw, <laughs> actually, I think it's Dr. McGraw technically, but whatever. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff that McGraw has said in this whole thing has been just completely made up. Just like this. He just didn't say it was. Well, of yeah, course right. it is. Uh, it's it's got to be contagion effect. People are seeing that they can say, well, it's they just feel more free to come out uh, about it. Well, well, it's the popular... Yeah, that's such rubbish. The Not only is it a contagion effect, as we can tell by its insanely rapid spread, but we know it's a contagion effect because psychogenic epidemics have always raged through young women. Okay, psychogenic, what he's talking about here, sounds like a big word, right? Wow, big scary word. He's a psychologist. He must, he must know what he's talking about. Psychogenic episodes or whatever psychogenic effects that he's referring to here were studied 200 years ago. And the reason that they started the study was because they believed that it was possible for somebody with schizophrenia, for example, I'll just throwing a word out there, schizophrenia, to walk into a room and say nothing 
to anybody. Not say a word. Walk in, sit down, and read a book. And everybody in the room catch schizophrenia just from being around them. They believe that mind conditions versus physical conditions were transmissible through proxy. That's what psychogenic episodes means. And the psychogenic episodes study, as I said, was like 200 years ago, hasn't been studied since, has been debunked. It's nonsense. It's garbage. It's worthless. I can't even believe he's saying the word psychogenic right now. It's like an embarrassment to this guy, to this supposed research professor of psychology, to even bring something like that up. It's like everything that Carl Jung and Freud said is debunked at this point, pretty much. Just about everything is fake. But they were the fathers of psychology, respectable. I can appreciate that they were around and that they helped people, you know, legitimize psychology as a real study. That was helpful. That was useful. But for the record, as Carl Jung believed... We aren't going to evolve past human by gaining two additional chromosomes, and we aren't going to accomplish that feat by placing crystals in 12 towers around the world. That's not going to happen, as was believed by the father of psychology. As was believed by Freud, one of the fathers of psychology, we aren't all obsessed with our mothers and all of our problems do not route back to her and no we don't all want to have sex with our mothers it was nonsense then and it's nonsense now thank you guys for legitimizing psychology i really appreciate that it was super helpful and nice of you every word out of your fucking mouth was uh, was just complete nonsensical bullshit now, how many years ago did Carl Jung, who had the crystals idea, live? 1875. 150, 175 years ago. We'll say, no, 150 years ago. 150. Freud was 175 to, yeah, we'll say 175 years ago. The two fathers of psychology were alive after the psychogenic, uh, you know, episode or the psychogenic condition existed or the, the study started. This guy is, cer is citing research older than Freud and Carl Jung themselves and claiming that it's real. It's just nonsensical garbage. Always has been. Nobody has bothered studying it since then because it's so obviously nonsensical. Hang on. I have some Peterson videos here. Let me find. Um... Uh, so I noticed. You... Yeah, here we go. Okay. Kyle Kolinsky did an interview with Jordan Peterson like forever ago. When did he do this? This was um, July 8th, 2022, when this interview took place. And it really revealed something about these people, or about uh, Jordan Peterson, I mean. It revealed something about him. So I want to listen to this just real short interview. It's not the whole thing. Uh, between... Kyle Kolinsky and Jordan Peterson. Just listen to this guy make a fool of himself. Uh, so I noticed just the other day you were banned from Twitter. Now, you know, I'm somebody... Of course, this is before the twit was owned by uh, Musk. Nobody can argue against my lefty credentials. Everybody knows um, I'm a man of the left. Having said that, my my solution on this issue of social media censorship has always been 
look, we need to expand First Amendment protections. And the way you do that is to regulate these big social media companies like their public utilities. So if you I've given his uh, ideas credence, I've thought about it, but I disagree. Do that, then you, you know, basically you're saying this is the new public square and people can speak their mind here. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, you can't, you know, dox people or do direct threats of violence or anything like anything that's actually illegal will remain illegal. But outside of that, you can't censor people just based on um, political opinion. So, you know, I definitely would. That wasn't happening on the old Twitter, but OK. Of banned you, suspended you, et cetera. But I do have a question about that specific tweet that did get you in trouble because, you know, you said something to the effect of. Um, well, I don't know if it got me in trouble. You know, I don't think I'm in trouble. Twitter. Oh, my God. Twitter banned me, but I don't consider well, that trouble. That's <laughs> fair enough. Fair point. Um, but you said something to the effect of remember when pride was a sin and um, mm -hmm. uh, the criminal. Yeah, he's conflict. It's called equivocating. He's using the word differently than the gay pride movement is. And applying it to like a biblical framework when that's not how it was being used in the first place. But that's neither here nor there. Physicians. And Ellen Page just had her breasts cut off by a criminal physician. A criminal physician. Right. Elliot Page is a trans person who, you know, I'm only saying this because he said it, for the sake of completion, used to go by Ellen Page, is no longer Ellen Page. Famous, uh, famously played in Juno and maybe The Hunger Games, I think. Umbrella Academy was in that. The point is that Elliot Page, now a man, had a breast reduction or breast removal surgery. And Jordan Peterson called that criminal, said he's a criminal physician for doing so. And he got banned for Twitter for it. Exactly. So my question is, is the physician really criminal? If you agree that adults can decide to transition, then why would the physician be criminal? Don't adults have that right if they want to transition? Yeah, freedom, baby. Just dead silence. Like <laughs> I didn't pause it. It's just dead silence. Not everything legal isn't criminal. Um, no, that's the definition of criminal against the law. The legal system and criminality are inextricably linked. What you mean to say, you, you know, I'm not that guy always bagging on people. I'll let Greg Locke do it for me. I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of areas. I've lived for the Lord my whole life, and I was dumb as a box of rocks and didn't know it. Thank you, Shane, and thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Not in that order, necessarily. Uh, what he meant to say was, not everything moral is legal. Very different, but okay. Okay, you know what? Not going to nitpick here. Let's just keep listening. And do they have that right? See, I would have left. It. Yes, they do have that right. Legally, they have that right. Ellen Page alone, if she hadn't been parading her new abs in a fashion magazine. Oh, you would have left her alone if she weren't being herself. You would have left her alone if she weren't doing what makes her comfortable, living her life, uh, expressing her own personal freedom. Huh. When people express freedom and do what they want to do with their lives, I guess he has a problem with that. Okay. How many kids do you think she can convince to convert? A one? Yeah. Thousand? People don't convert to being gay or trans or whatever. It is what it is. You're either gay or you're trans. No, not, See, yeah. I, no, no, really? I want to I wanna respond to that. I yeah. think that with the trans... God, he's so fucking... I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy community it's very similar to the gay community where back when that first became a big issue people thought oh if we talk about it if it's in magazines or whatever we're promoting kids to go down that path but really what happened is people are who they are that, and if that they're is gay they just decided to be no. like yeah i'm gay and they were just yes yes that is exactly what happened more open and honest with themselves so i don't think you're promoting people to do that no, that's you're just not saying, what happened if you are th that is what happened and it's okay wrong. Okay, well, You're I'm, utterly I'm, wait, wrong. I'm listening. There's I'm nothing listening. about that that's right. So explain. Well, there's been an absolute look. One of the reasons that I 
opposed Bill C-16 in Canada to begin. Okay, if you're unfamiliar, C-16 is the bill that got him famous. And it was a, a Canada, it was a bill in Canada that basically made it so that being trans was a protected class in the same way that, um, you know, being Christian is a protected class, for example, or being black is a protected class, you know. It just gave people the protections of law for being gay, straight, trans, cis, black, white, Christian, Muslim, whatever. It's all just protecting people's rights. That's it. And he made this big thing out of it, pretending that if he said, if he misgendered somebody, then he's going to be put in jail. Like, that's not what the bill said. And he very obviously didn't even read the bill. Or he read the bill and wanted to be dishonest. I don't know which. That's what got him famous. Coming out against B Bill C-16. It was just complete bullshit from the start. It was a scam from the start. Anyway, just listen to more of this. Look, one of the reasons that I opposed Bill C-16 in Canada to begin with, this pronoun compelled speech bill, it wasn't a compelled speech bill. It was a civil rights bill to protect people from discrimination. It was because I knew perfectly well what was going to happen when we introduced confusion about gender identity into the public what, people are going to be protected public sphere. Now, the argument was that if we left people with gender dysphoria alone to make their own way and stop torturing them, that we would decrease the mental health load on those individuals. And my analysis as a clinician was that for every... As a clinician, notice him using... This is an argument from authority. I'm an authority on the subject. I can speak on it. Nobody else can disagree with me because I'm a clinician. That's not how science works. We take the consensus of um, uh, scientific research and make a determination based off that. But, you know, one single clinician, quote-unquote, can say what he wants, I suppose. One person of that sort that we hypothetically save, we doom a thousand more. So for every one person that we allow to be trans, we doom a thousand more people to become trans, is what he's saying. Well, that's simply false. Like, we can empirically, objectively prove that to be a lie, a falsehood. Now, is he going to address the fact that that's a flat-out, bald-faced lie? Of course he's not. He's going to pretend he never said it, or he's going to double down and insist it's real. As a consequence of confusion and social contagion. I knew the literature on psychogenic epidemics. This is the thing that made me look at look this literature up in the first place. 200 years old, older than Sigmund Freud, older, I mean, older than when he was practicing, older than Carl Jung, the two fathers of psychology, contemporaries. And he's going back to this. It's like, you know what it's like? Do you, you, you want to know what, um, the psychogenic episode thing is very, very similar to. There's this incel belief that if you sleep with somebody... Uh, all right, let me rephrase. There's this incel belief that if, um, if a, a female horse, a mare, I think it's called, if a female horse tries to breed with a male horse and it doesn't really take, like the pregnancy doesn't stick, they have a miscarriage or something. And then they try to breed with another and it doesn't stick, you know, it fails. And then they breed with a third. The claim by incels and, you know, other people around, I don't know if Jordan Peterson buys into this, is that, the personality or the DNA of the previous two horses sticks around in the, the mare, the female horse. And when she finally has a baby with that third horse, it is actually a mix 
genetically of the three horses total. Um, and that's like the basis for the belief that women should be completely chaste. They should only sleep with their husbands. They're pure if they only if they're only ever with their husbands. The basis is because if they sleep with like three or four other people, then really, if you have a kid with them, you're having four other people's kid. It's nonsense. It's garbage. It's pseudoscientific garbage. And just like that is pseudoscientific garbage, psychogenic episodes is just as absurd. It's just as ridiculous and unsupported scientifically. Psychogenic episodes, quote-unquote, are fake. It doesn't exist. It's been studied into the ground. And so is the other thing about uh, mares and, and all of that and horses. It's been studied into the ground, and it's all garbage. Anyway, let's continue listening to this. I'm not that guy. I swear I'm not that guy. I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of areas. Facebook just makes people think I'm smart. Thank you, Greg, for expressing my opinions for me. I knew the literature on psychogenic epidemics. They used to call that mass hysteria. And so yeah, it's fake. Literature that goes back about 300 years. No, it's 300 years old. There's a difference. It doesn't go back 300 years. It's 300 years old. And whenever you introduce... Often when you introduce social confusion, you can produce a psychogenic epidemic, especially among, generally, it's adolescent females who are most susceptible to it. Dude, I have no idea what he's even talking about right now. Again, this literature is 300 years old. You'd have to look through old dusty books to find it. You won't be able to find it on Google Scholar, probably, unless it's been, like, transliterated into, like, book form on Google Books or something. So I thought, oh, well, what's going to happen is we'll produce a psychogenic epidemic of gender dysphoria among adolescent females. And that is exactly what's happened. No, it's just completely made up. Like everything that he's saying here is completely made up. And it isn't the fact that we've freed up people who are, what, in doubt about their identity to be who they are. That may have happened in a tiny minority of cases. It's absolutely and definitely the case that we've doomed thousands of kids to brute. And how are you so absolutely and definitely sure of that exactly? Can you give me some insight into how you came to these conclusions? Damn, I really wanted that. Uh, I really wanted that that rocket, and it just disappeared on me. Oh, I don't even need it. Never mind. I thought I needed that rocket. Anyway. How can you be so absolutely and definitely sure of what you're saying? Because the literature that this guy is citing is complete garbage, 100% nonsensical garbage that we've known to be garbage for 300 years, basically. He seems awfully confident in nonsense right now. Cool mutilating surgery and premature sterility and we've done that on the altar of our hypothetical moral virtue and compassion look i read a cor corporate analysis of the trans surgery industry last week growth rate projection for you lefty types and your anti-corporatism growth rate projection 15 percent per year invest now a 350 million dollar business as of 2022 Projected to expand to $750 million by 2027. I have no idea what he's even talking about. If any of this is accurate, if he's just making this shit up, that wouldn't surprise me at all. In fact, I'd be surprised if he wasn't making this shit up. But you know what? Uh, what did he say? 15% growth per year? Um, is he saying that in five years, the world is going to be 100% trans? I mean, that's not exactly how, uh, you know, numbers work. It's not how statistics work exactly, of course, because, you know, you take 15% of what it currently is, say, I don't know how, 6,000 people in 
the world, maybe, or in the United States. Let's just take the U.S. Say there are 15,000 people. I'm sorry. Say there are 6,000. Uh, let's make it a round number. Say there are 10,000 people in the United States every year who come out as trans and want trans-affirming surgery, right? 10,000 a year. A 15% increase means it's now 10,100. No, means it's 10,000. Hang on. Means it's 11,150, I believe, right? Am I wrong on that? 11,150? The following year, it's not an additional 1150. It's a 15% growth rate from there. So 11, no, it's 11150 times 0.15, actually. So the following year, it'd be 12,822. The following year from that, it would be 14,745. So we've gone from 10,000 people over the course of three years. We're looking at 14,000 people at most. He says 15% growth per year. It sounds scary because it sounds like, uh, well, if you add, you know, three years together, that's 45% growth. Um, we're looking at 45% of the United States is going to be trans. No, that's not how it works. Actually, how you do it is you do 15 times... No, you do the corollary of 15, which is 0.85 times 0.85 times 0.85 times 0.85 times 0.85. So... 0.44%, I think. Um, so 10,000 times uh, 1.44. So actually, over the course of five years, if I have my math right, it's been forever since I've had a math class in college. I think we're looking at uh, 15,000, being generous, 15,000 people over the course of five years rather than 10,000. What he's saying here sounds super ultra mega scary. It's not. Now, listen one more time to him manipulate these numbers and make it sound scarier than it actually is. $150 million business as of 2022, projected to expand to $750 million by 2027. By who? No moral hazard there. Guess we'll never know who he's talking about. Who did these projections? Who did these pre predictions? Nobody ever says. We never get a name. We never get like a, a polling agency or like a, a, a scientific study or nothing. Fear monger Jordan Peter Peterson here has just decided to lay a bunch of numbers down and pretend that they're correct. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Expand to 750 million by 2027. No moral hazard there? No, no moral hazard there. That's correct. We're still only talking 15,000 people a year instead of 10,000. There's no gigantic fear, like moral hazard happening right now. There's plenty so, of moral hazard what, there. What and percentage? that surgery is absolutely brutal. So what percentage of the population do you think uh, in your conception of how this is unfolding, what percentage of the population do you think is going to end up being trans at the end of this? Do you think? So let's say, I don't know how many uh, trans affirming surgeries we have per year. Let's just, uh, you know, I think it's somewhere around 6,000 maybe, but let's just be generous and we're going to assume 10,000 again, even though that's probably not accurate. Let, just because it's a round number. So 10,000 per year, right? 15% growth per year means 15,000 per year instead of 10,000 per year in five years. Out of 330 million? 
we are talking 0.0045% of the population in five years in Jordan Peterson's worst case scenario fear. 0.0045% of the population worst case scenario is going to be trans. This dude lives in like a delusion where, look, he has a PhD. He had to have taken statistics at some point in his life, right? Sometime, somewhere along the way, he took statistics. I didn't even take statistics, and I understand this. I took business math. I took accounting. And I understand this. Now, this guy has a PhD. You cannot convince me that a literal high school dropout right here, okay? Literal high school dropout with a two-year degree in substance abuse counseling as opposed to Jordan Peterson's um, presumably eight-year PhD is smarter. You can't convince me that I'm more knowledgeable about this stuff. I'm just doing basic shit here. This is basic shit than uh, basic numbers anybody can run. Percentage of the population do you think is going to end up being trans at the end of this? Do you think like oh, one day it's going to be like seventy percent of the we know country already, is trans? Well, we know already that about one in five adolescents now identifies to use that hated word. Um, that's I, I don't believe him. I'm sorry. I'm just like I'm not buying a word out of his mouth. Everything that this guy says seems to be, if not an outright lie, at best, a manipulated, whacked out truth that has no real connection to reality anymore, that he's just warped out of recognition at this point. Identifies as part of the hypothetical LGBTQ plus community. So it's one in five. I don't know what the upper limit is. There's a consulting group in the UK now that's... 90, 90%. 90% of the US is going to be uh, trans if Jordan Peterson is to be believed, right? I mean, there's 150 different genders. There's actually, I suppose, 7 billion different genders if you want to get technical about it because everybody's temperament differs. But I don't know what the upper limit is. Wait, did he say A... What was the A... Un Hang on. Let me listen again. Who is it that claimed this? Okay, now that's claiming there's 100. Uh, one, one, more to, one more time. Identifies, to use that hated word, identifies as part of the hypothetical LGBTQ plus community. So it's one in five. I don't know what the upper limit is. There's a consulting group in the UK now that's... Consulting group in the UK? Which consulting group? Who? What's their name? Who do they consult with? What's the company worth? Are they actually valid? Who are they associated with? Is it a right-wing consulting group? Is it a think tank, like a right-wing think tank? Or is it a legitimate government group that exists to help determine these things for the purposes of, uh, you know, for the purpose of uh, census data and understanding society and things like that. What is this consulting group? What are you talking about? Claiming there's 150 different genders. There's actually, I suppose, 7 billion different genders if you want to get technical about it because everybody's temperament differs. But I don't know what the upper limit is, and I have no idea what the upper limit is for this surgical intervention. We'll see. Doesn't but that... I don't find it. I, I don't find it the least bit acceptable. And if you think that your compassion is demanding that you extend your uh, pity to the LGBTQ plus community at the cost of sterilizing children, you should think again. You're on the wrong side of this, and not Wait, in a trivial on. way. Don't uh, I? I would appreciate if you don't ascribe beliefs to me that I don't have. Remember my original question. Well, about, you said earlier in well, this I said, question that, I said that you Elliot were, Page is an adult, and so do you think that he has the right to yeah, transition? But the, that was the original question. You made question. some comments after that. Yeah, but as a star mm -hmm. and a public figure and a model for emulation, mm -hmm. she also has the responsibility not to... He, he has the responsibility. You're just being a scumbag now, needlessly.
You don't have to be like this. You don't have to be a fucking asshole. You can be a normal human being for 15 seconds if you chose. Is this guy just like intentionally choosing to be, you know, again, I'm not that guy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be bagging on people all the time. I'm just going to play this clip and say, serenity now. I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of areas. Serenity now. Emulation. Mm -hmm. She also has the responsibility not to entice confused adolescents into a catastrophic decision. Yeah, he, she, uh, Elliot Page is enticing people into this whole thing. Elliot Page is trying to convince people to be trans. Disgusting, huh? My God, dude, get a grip on reality. I'm begging you. Sometimes I wonder myself, like, is this guy a true believer? Does he, like, really buy the bullshit that he's selling? Or is he just a scam artist? It's so hard to know sometimes. When I hear him say things like this, it makes me think that he's a true believer. I don't know. Tell me what you think about it in the comments. Is he a real, is he the real deal? Does he really believe what he's selling? For they have the maturity to make that decision. I just have to say, Jordan, I think it's a little bit of a moral panic. I just don't see some sort of. It absolutely is a moral panic. Yes, he's correct about that one. But, you know, frenzy. Okay, of what would you consider? Become trans. What? First of all, that's a hell of a way to put it. What? Is, Why don't you that... take a look at the increase in, in surgical interventions and see what you think? I mean, how? He's offended on behalf of all of the people who are turning trans. He's offended for them. How many do you think well, is too many? Again, How many, wait, look, the, if we're talking about I'll, I'll suffering- I'll answer your question, I'll answer your question. The argument is it, it used to be very repressed because that's very outside of the tradition and the norm and the standard. And that now we what sort of let the be, boot off the neck a little bit. Suppressed? What used to be suppressed? All the, exactly. the entire LGBTQ- Being left-handed, say that. Being left-handed used to be suppressed. And now it's not. And now we have, uh, it, you know, I think it peaked at 12%. And in the exact same way, being LGBT is no longer as suppressed as it once was. And there are more people coming out as LGBT. Community. I mean, it was very recently we okay, even first got of gay all, marriage not in the United States. First of all, they're not a community. Um, yes, they are. Well, you understand what the point this I'm community? making. What is this community? No, I'm it, it's a group of people who are LGBT. I don't understand. Do you not know what the word community means? Is this the first time you've ever heard the term or what? No, actually, neither I understand it nor you. And that's why we're delving into it. <laughs> um, what? No, people understand it. They just like this guy just disagrees with the scientific consensus and every other person on planet Earth, practically, except for Trump nutcases, that's all. First of all, they're not a community. That's just a catchphrase, it's a buzzword. And I'll tell you something else, that almost all the kids who are undergoing surgical intervention, the clinical literature is absolutely clear on this. 80% of kids with gender dysphoria identify as homosexual when they mature, 80%. Okay, I don't like that does not even sound right, but you know what? Okay, whatever. Fine. Let's just take it. And that means the vast majority of people who are being converted surgically are gay. Now, how is that an advantage to the gay community precisely? No. See, I'm not I'm not taking a position in any way shape or form on the kids because I don't know the well, first you thing about this to comment on the kids. Well, all right, let me tell you something about kids, quote unquote, and Jordan Peterson's fear mongering about it. Um, it is and has always been illegal for people under the age of 18, kids, if you will, to get gender affirming surgeries, to get bottom surgery. 
Now, breast reductions and things, those should be legal because people genuinely need that shit. Like, I knew a girl in high school, at, at what, ninth grade maybe, name was Jen. She had to get a breast reduction surgery. She's like a double E. And she's just like a normal-sized person. It was just too much. She had to get a breast reduction. That's not really like i get that under the current expectations beliefs and feelings that would be breast or that would be gender affirming care but it's not gender affirming care we need to make breast reduction surgeries available for people without a shadow of a doubt as far as surgical intervention goes now regarding bottom surgeries so top surgery should be allowed bottom surgeries on the other hand are not allowed, have never been allowed since the founding of the country. It's never been the case. But, you know, fear monger is going to fear monger, so here we sit. But see, that's why we're having this conversation, though, is because my original question was about kids. the adults and what your take is on the adults. Hmm. And it sounds to me like, let me ask you this, would you ban transition surgery for adults? Yeah, we're talking about adults right now, not children. Jesus, dude. Oh, wow. I thought I had accidentally paused it. No, I didn't pause it. He's just sitting there in dead silence. Would you ban trans-affirming surgeries for adults? I don't know. Really? Are you fucking kidding me? This is literally your entire fucking life, and you haven't thought this one through? Really? Really? Yeah, really? No, the answer is, wow, I just realized that this trans, uh, that this, um, wow, I just realized that this conflicts with my already existing beliefs, and I don't know how to answer it. Boy, I better just shut my mouth and say, I don't know. See, We're paying a me, big price for it, and I well, think that, I think that it was. We've paid a big price for it, he says. Um, it was a, an act of stunning hubris to conduct the first trans surgery procedure but and it's not obvious to me at all that it's been a net social good and but so aren't there some people that are obviously trans who were born in one body they feel like they're in the other body and when they're an adult they can make the decision and then even from just a freedom and liberty perspective shouldn't they have that right even if they do it and then they regret it shouldn't they have the right to try it it's a good question i mean it's a tricky one right because they're no 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 it's not a tricky one People should be able to do what they want, full stop. Unless your actions are interfering with my right to be who I am and to do what I want or whatever, I should be allowed to do it, period. You, your right to swing your fist ends right here on my nose. You can swing it anywhere except for here. It's not tricky. It's pretty fucking straightforward, actually. I'm sorry. It's pretty fucking straightforward, actually. Tricky one, right? Because there's all sorts of surgical enhancement procedures that are obviously, it's not obviously appropriate to make them illegal. Oh, my God. And I don't know exactly where the cutoff line is, so to speak, and that's partly why we're having a public discussion about it. No, we're having a public discussion because you're a... F I'm not that guy. I am not that guy. I will not do it. Not going to be the dude who's always bagging on people. We're having the public discussion because you are going around dead naming people and hurting the LGBT community. That's why we're having that public discussion, because you've turned it into a public discussion and feel it's important enough to denigrate an entire group of people for no reason just because you want to seemingly but uh this 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 entire argument in many ways is stated so idiotically that it almost defies description I mean, what do you mean feel like you're in the wrong body are you serious are, like are, are you for real right now like is this real or or is this an act is this the first time that you've ever heard of psychology before human psychology what do you mean feel like i'm depressed what does that mean what can you possibly mean by i feel depressed 
get help, Jordan. Like this faux, ridiculous, bullshit fear um, or concern trolling is about as transparent as it gets, honestly. Get over yourself. Well, what kind of measurement is that? No, hang on a sec. I was gonna there are you. rules <laughs> for these sorts of diagnostic decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. The rule is that you have to make a valid and reliable diagnosis. That's if you're diagnosing depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or cancer or anything like that. There are yes, there are diagnostic values that you can look to. Things that everybody who has been diagnosed with, say, depression or anxiety or whatever, things that they all have in common with each other. You have to give affirmative care because you have to assume what they're telling you is accurate and correct and real and true. You're affirming their, their depression and you're finding a way to fix it to the best of your ability. That's what's happening. Viable diagnosis. That's if you're diagnosing depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder. So you got to find a viable diagnosis, okay? Or, or cancer or anything like that. There are standards that you have to abide by mm. in order to make a diagnosis, in order to fulfill the obligations of your professional college. Sure. If someone comes to you and says, I feel like I have lung cancer, that is not sufficient grounds upon which to formulate a diagnosis. Much Absolutely. You are correct, good sir. You need to go through the process of testing and comparing against similar situations. Look, let's assume that you have zero equipment at your disposal, none. Let's assume it's just you and that person in that room alone with two chairs, and they're saying, I feel like I have lung cancer. It's still possible to determine if they do by talking to other people who have lung cancer and asking about their experiences, about how they feel when they have lung cancer, comparing it to how this person telling you this uh, is expressing themselves. That's how you tell if depression is real or if somebody has depression. That's how you tell if somebody has an anxiety disorder or if they have gender dysphoria or any other number of things. You assume it's real. Affirmative care. You're, you assume that they have depression. Affirmative care. Until you're given reason to think otherwise. And you compare it against the symptoms of others who you know have had depression. Or who have had lung cancer. Who have had whatever. That's how this works. And he's pretending like he doesn't know any of this, as if he wasn't a research professor for some period of time. Like, give me a fucking break, really. Like I have lung cancer. That is not sufficient grounds upon which to formulate a diagnosis, much less proceed to surgery. Thinking? No, it's not. Just thinking something is not. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what do you mean by feel? What is that? Is that an emotion? Is it a well, motivation? Is it a philosophical so, conclusion? What is so it? Well, that's literally your job, Jordan, to figure that out. Do they just feel that way? Or is there something behind the way that these people feel? This dude is the biggest joke on planet Earth. He has betrayed every ethical principle and idea that he swore to uphold as a clinical psychologist, every one of them. Let me, explain, let me explain to you what I mean. Like, I have a two-year degree in this field, okay? A two-year degree in substance abuse counseling. I'm not so... Oh, and I'm a high school dropout. I'm not some, like, crazy knowledgeable guy on this subject, okay? I'm just some dude. And I know more about this subject. I know more about this subject than Jordan Peterson is pretending to know. Now, do I believe that I know more than him? No, I don't. He knows way more about this subject than me. But he's pretending to be dumb as dog shit. Why? So he can refer to Elliot Page as Ellen Page, presumably. 
explain to you what I mean. So I've been doing my show for about a decade. And about mm-hmm. two or three years into doing my show, there were, you know, some stories here and there that I covered about the trans issue. Somebody who is trans reached out to me and explained to me in a very straightforward way. Yeah, look, I was born biologically female. I feel like I'm biologically male. My reality what does never that mean? lined up. Well, feel. Me, I'm just explaining. Are you fucking kidding me? He really doesn't know what that means. Is this literally the are have you not taken psychology 101 yet? Is this like your first time? Are you still in your first semester of your psychology degree? What do you mean? What does that mean? What they said, and then you can respond however you'd like to respond. And they told me as soon as I got the surgery, changed the way I dressed, changed the way I appeared, I felt phenomenally better. And so that's why, at least for me, this was the answer. Now, I think it would be incredibly arrogant for me to say back to that person, no, you shouldn't do that, or I know better than you do for yourself. Now, that's not to say that every time somebody does this, it works out well, of course, because everybody's an individual. But in some instances, that's the answer. So, you know, me as a simple outsider, I just look at it and say, hey, whatever floats your boat, and if it works, it works. Look, most of the time, my... Yeah, that's a libertarian perspective. That's supposed to be the Republican perspective. Freedom, right? Patriotism and freedom. That's what it's all about. But not for Jordan Peterson, apparently. He wants to impose his will upon other people. He wants to force others to believe and view things the way that he does. Attitude is you can go to hell in handbasket any way you choose if you're an adult. <laughs> now, the problem, this problem is complicated and compounded by the fact of the necessity of medical involvement and the ethics on the medical front. Not really. I mean, people can do what they want. You know, there's a you know that there's a guy. Hold on. Let me just pull this up real quick. I got to get out of here. It's late, late. But I did just give me a second. Entertain me for a second here. Hold on. Are you kidding? What? This guy right here that you're looking at on screen, this is tattoos and body modifications that he got. It's called the black alien. It's he lives in France. Apparently he had two fingers surgically removed to form a claw. He had his nose and upper lip cut off and his tongue split. That's a shame. Like he was actually, he looked really good. That's really sad. I'm I'm really heartbroken for this dude that he did all of this. This is a bad idea. But you know what? It was his bad idea to make. I have no place to step into his life and impose my will on him. Force him to be what one might call normal. Force him to be what I consider to be normal. It's not my place to do. You know what my place is? To support those who want to do those things, or at least not get in their way. That's life. That's what it's all about, baby. Welcome to real life. First time, Jordan? So when you asked me about how that should be regulated, my answer was I'm not exactly sure about that. Yeah, Although it isn't obvious. Uh, didn't he just like bitch about people who offer like criticisms and try to poke holes in things but don't offer solutions i feel like i feel like i heard him complaining about that recently with uh, phil mcgraw to me that the that it's obvious to me that the trans surgery enterprise has gone way too far way too far thousands of people too far and i'm certain that it's harmed exponentially more people than it's helped Okay, great. Well, that was their decision. So I don't know, like, what else you want from anybody. Like, th- they had an option to do this thing, and they chose to do it, and here we sit. And this guy is, like, just doing nothing but complaining and whining and crying and pretending to be a victim or some other nonsense. Just a joke, man. 
And we tell me what you think about Jordan Peterson in the comments. He is shameless. He is a shameless liar, a scam artist, as far as I can tell. Like, give me a break. Anyway. All right. Let me just, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm going to call it there. I'm going to ship these books. And I'm going to start um, printing labels for the others, too. Where was I? T King, big fan of Kyle's and you. I appreciate it. Glad you're here. Gifted one oh and uh unfiltered membership. Thanks, Eric Wander. Glad you're here too. Cynthia Norwood, thank you for the uh sticker. Yeah, I think I'm caught up. Jim Baker choking on his bucket. That's good. Oh, that's good. Let me write that one down too. I have one from Nericle from the other day, I think. I'm gonna write that one down too. Okay, I have to get out of here for real. I would read jokes and fun facts and stuff, but I got to get going because I have to uh, bring these to the post office before they close, okay? All right, thanks for coming, guys. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys on Sunday, hopefully for the live stream, okay? Otherwise, I'll see you next week. And right, have a good one, everybody.